Bible friends, this is Aunt Sil, and today I have a really special story for you called Loaves and Fishes. Our memory verse is from Galatians 6.10 and it says, Let us do good to all people. Do you see Jesus? Jesus loves to tell stories and the people loves to hear Jesus' stories. But right now, Jesus is tired. Jesus needs a rest from telling stories. Jesus and his friends climb into the boat. Goodbye, Jesus. Take care. Where is Jesus going? He's going to cross the lake. Do you see all the people? See the boys and girls. They all want to be with Jesus. They want to hear Jesus tell stories. Hurry, little child. Jesus is coming. Bring your lunch. Look. Jesus is coming. Jesus is going to tell more stories. All day Jesus tells stories. The little child is hungry. Jesus is hungry. Everybody is hungry. Is that your lunch, little child? What is in the little child's lunch basket? One, two, three, four, five loaves, and one, two little fishes. The day is late. Everyone is hungry. Send the people away, Jesus' friends say. No, the people are tired. The people are hungry. You feed them. But Jesus, we have no money to buy food for all these people. And we have no food. Here, the little child says. Take my food, Jesus. Very good, little child. Thank you for sharing your food. Jesus takes the basket. He is praying. Thank you, God, for this food. Thank you for this little child who has shared. See Jesus? He breaks the bread. He shares the bread. And the fish. Jesus shares everything. And the bread never stops coming. Everyone is sharing the bread. Everybody is eating. Come, take the bread to the people. Everybody is eating. Everyone is sharing the bread. Yum, 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 delicious bread. Everybody's eating. This is good food. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the story and for the food. Thank you, little child. Thank you for sharing your lunch. The Bible says, let us do good to all people. And that's what Jesus wants from you. Be good to one another and always share what you have. If with one apple happy I am, but you have nothing half I'll give you, then with you I share it because I care. This way an apple you have right there. If with my toys happy I am, but you have nothing half I'll give you then. With you I share them because I care. This way some toys you have right there. Let's pray. Dear God, 
Thank you so much for giving us enough to share with others. Let me have a pure heart, a beautiful heart, that shares with others in need. In Jesus' name, amen. Always remember, Jesus is very happy when you share, and he wants you to do good to all people. Hello, boys and girls. This is Aunt Fernita, and I have a wonderful story for you called Jesus Goes to a Party. Today's memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 9. It says, Burst into songs of joy together. The message for today's story is we have fun with our family and friends. Do you like parties? Do you like to eat yummy food and play games with your family and friends? Jesus liked to have fun too. He liked to visit his family and his friends. Jesus and his friends were going to a party. No, it wasn't a birthday party. It was a wedding party. Where Jesus lived, when people got married, they had a party that lasted many days. So they had lots of food to eat and juice to drink. Some of Jesus' family came to this wedding party, too. His mother Mary was there. She helped plan the party. And some of Jesus' special friends were there, too. Everyone was having fun. Everyone except the people who planned the party. They were worried. The servants came to Mary and said, The juice is all gone. What should we do? The party will be ruined. The bride and the groom will be so embarrassed. Oh my, what can I do? Jesus' mother wondered. Mary turned and saw Jesus. Quietly she went to him and said, The juice is all gone. Jesus looked around. He saw some big water jugs. He spoke quietly to the servants and said, Go fill the big water jugs with water. They were puzzled. What good would that do? They wondered. But they did as Jesus said. When all the jugs were full, Jesus said to the servants, Take some to the person in charge of the party. The men poured some of the water into a cup. But it wasn't water anymore. It was juice. Good, sweet grape juice. Now there would be enough juice for the party. The servants took a nice, cool glass of the juice to the man in charge of the party. He tasted it, and then he drank it all. Mmm, this is such good juice, he said to the bridegroom. Most people serve the best juice at the beginning of the wedding feast, but you have saved the best until last. The servants were excited. Jesus' mother and his friends were pleased, and the bride and groom were happy too. Jesus' friends began talking among themselves about the miracle juice. This was Jesus' first miracle. They had seen his amazing power. But what would happen in the days ahead? Jesus showed love to the bride and the bridegroom, to his mother and to his friends, the happy times you have with your friends and family are special to Jesus, too. We show love when we have fun with our family and friends. Hello, everyone. This is Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called who is my neighbor? The memory verse is from Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. The message is everyone is included in God's love. Jake sat down in an empty chair in the Sabbath school room. The other children were talking together but Jake sat alone. He didn't know anyone. He felt out of place. No one spoke to him. His family had just arrived from a faraway country. 
He spoke with an accent. It hurt to be lonely. Why wouldn't anyone speak to him? In today's Bible lesson, Jesus told a story about a man who was hurting and needed help. Who would pay attention to him? The young lawyer stood up. He straightened his belt and cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Teacher, what shall I do to have eternal life? What do the scriptures say? asked Jesus. That I should love God with all of my heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love my neighbor as much as I love myself. The lawyer replied, You're right, Jesus said. Keep doing these things and eternal life is yours. But just who is my neighbor? questioned the young man. Let me tell you a story, said Jesus, smiling. Once there was a man who left Jerusalem to travel to Jericho. Along the way, robbers attacked him. They beat him. They took his money and clothes and left him lying in the hot sun, half dead. It just so happened that a Jewish priest was traveling the same way. A little later, he came to the place where the injured man was lying. Quickly, he looked away. He may have thought, Oh no, that man's in great pain. I can't tell if he is a Jew or not. I better hurry on. And the priest crossed to the other side of the road and went on his way. Soon a Levite who worked in the temple came by. Curious, he stopped to look at the wounded man. Poor man, he may have thought. He looks terrible. I really ought to help him but I don't want to get involved. I wish that I had not come this way. Surely someone else will help him. And the Levite hurried down the road. It wasn't long until a Samaritan came by. Jesus looked around. He knew that the Jewish people hated the Samaritans. But he continued. The Samaritan felt sorry for the poor man and stopped right away to help him. He gave him water he put medicine on the man's wounds. He gently helped him up on his own donkey. Carefully, he took the injured man to the nearest inn, where he stayed with him through the night. In the morning, he gave the innkeeper money to take care of the hurt man. Let me know if that isn't enough, said the Samaritan. I'll gladly pay you more Jesus looked into the young lawyer's eyes. Now, my friend, he quietly asked, which of the three was a neighbor to the wounded man? The one who helped him, the young man answered quietly. Jesus spoke kindly, Go, go now and be that kind of neighbor. Today, Jesus wants us to be good neighbors too. In God's eyes, every person is equal. Every person is someone to be loved and accepted no matter where they come from, how they sound when they speak, the color of their skin. This week, ask Jesus to make your heart like His. Ask Him to help you show His love to your neighbor. In 1964, Rachel Vetch bought a brand new Mercury Comet Caliente and she's been driving the car ever since. She decided to take very good care of it. Now most people would be happy if a car lasted 150,000 miles. Rachel right now is going on 540,000 miles on her original engine. And in case you think she's been driving it around like a grandma, she confesses sometimes she goes 120 miles an hour. How come her car's lasted so long? She's done all the scheduled maintenance and she stands and watches as it's done, taking very good care of her car. She also, whenever she buys a part, she gets the lifetime warranty. So she's been through seven Midas mufflers, three sets of Sears shocks, and 14 JCPenney batteries, all for the price of one. You know, it's amazing how long a car can last if you take good care of it. 
makes you wonder, how long will our bodies last if we take good care of them? Good question for us to consider in MIQ. Welcome, friends. How can I know that God is listening? Did I come from apes or prehistoric sludge? Can the Bible be trusted? What should I do with my life? College? Cars? A job? Can I ever be perfect? Can I make a difference? Do my parents can I make a difference? God? What should I do with my life? Why does a serious relationship is not supposed to change me? Or what? MIQ. Your questions, God's answers. Does it matter what I wear, who I date, what I eat? These are good questions for every body. Join us now for MIQ. Hello, everybody. This is MIQ, Amazing Facts for Teens. I'd like to welcome our audience here in Cedar Lake, Michigan, and also those of you who are watching on various television networks and online. Thank you for joining us again. And we'd like to hear from you. If you have a Bible question, you can go to the MIQ Teens website. MIQteens.com and you can post your question online. And friends, if you go to the MIQ Teen website, be sure to look at the various resources that we have online. If you've missed any previous programs, you can see the archive of the earlier ones. Just click on the link that says Archive Programs. We have a theme song that we like to sing at the beginning of each of our programs, and I'm going to invite our song leaders to please come forward at this time. Immediately following the song, Jordan will be having our opening prayer. Let's stand as we sing together, Jesus is the answer. When I gaze up at the countless stars, or on an endless sea, my mind makes swim with questions, bewildering to me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to come together and learn more about you um, here at MIQ. Please be with uh, Pastor Bachelor. Bless his words. Uh, I ask that you pour down the Holy Spirit to everyone listening to the message tonight. Help them to gain a blessing. Thank you for being such an amazing God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Kelly, our singers, and Jordan, for having our prayer. And thank you for joining us, friends. We're very glad for everybody that is here for our Most Important Question program. By the way, uh, I was talking to our office, and we're going to post the words and the guitar chords for the song. Some were wondering if they can play along. And 
There might be some of you who are watching. We've got a lot of young people, very talented and sophisticated with computers, have some of those programs that will convert a melody to sheet music. If you want to take that on and help us do that, we'd appreciate it. And then we can post the music as well as the guitar chords and the words of that song. It's kind of been evolving during the program. Mm -hmm. It has. Questions? Well, Pastor Doug, I think we're ready for questions, and let's get right to it. Hi, my name's Cindy, and my question is, where do we draw the line in cosmetics? Like, how much is too much? I don't know. Do you think I've got too much on? <laughs> Normally, this question should just apply to the girls. We hope, right? But when I do television, I've got such a big part in my head that they, they said that I shine if they don't put a little powder up there. What's the principle for a makeup? And for cosmetics. Well, I think that, first of all, Christians want to look healthy. They want to be as natural as possible. So the idea would be, you know, if, if there's some formal occasion and you, you know, or want to look your best, I don't believe it's a sin to do something to try to uh, improve your natural, healthy appearance. When you start doing all the sparkles and blue and green goo, and it just doesn't look very natural. Now, some of this is my opinion, but there is a scripture Bible tells us that uh, Jezebel painted her face and they threw her out the window. <laughs> so I'll let you apply that any way you want. Isn't that true? That Was that is true. Second that Kings? Is true. You search for it. It's in there. It's in Second Kings. All right. Well, let's take a look at our next question today. And this is a question that has come from Miami, Florida. Should we be scared of the end of the world? Well, obviously, if a person has accepted Christ and they have everlasting life, Jesus says, I'm come to give you peace. Uh, Paul talks about a peace that passes understanding. Over and over, Jesus said, fear not. Don't be afraid. So if we're believers, we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't have fear. But if you do not have the Lord in your life, and then you got the devil and all his minions tormenting you, it'd be perfectly normal for you to be uncomfortable about the approaching end. Matter of fact, I wouldn't want you to be at peace if you're on your way to destruction. I'd be pleading with you to come to Christ and find that peace. So it depends on where you are in your relationship with God. All right. That's how you're going to view the end of the world. Let's take a look at the next one. Hi, my name is Danielle, and my question is, if somebody commits suicide and they don't know that it's a sin, will it be held against them for eternity? Wow, that's a heavy question. I think all of us here probably know of somebody or might even have someone in the family that made this terrible mistake. Now, God looks on the heart. I want to be careful to preface my comments by saying God looks on the heart, and so we really can't judge externally. But um, typically, suicide represents someone who has entered a hopeless and faithless experience. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, there can be exceptions. You know, sometimes a person maybe has had an accident or they're going through so much pain or, um, you know, there could be some medication or some chemical imbalance, and that's why, you know, you've got to be very careful. But if you have ever contemplated suicide as a way to end your problems, that is exactly what the devil wants you to think because as long as you've got life, the Bible says a living dog is better than a dead lion. Where there is life, there is hope. When you commit suicide, you have permanently sealed your problems. Because if you die, first of all, if the last act of your life is self-murder, that's not very good hope for your future. Isn't it a sin to commit murder? And that would include yourself. And if you think by committing suicide, I'm going to relieve my problems, your next conscious thought is the resurrection of the lost, and your problems have been permanently sealed. So please don't ever let the devil make you think it'll get better by killing myself. It's the opposite. And in cases where you may know someone that's made that decision, just put it in God's hands because, uh, you know, you just have to trust the Lord and wait until that time comes. Now, there's a difference also between a suicide and a sacrifice. Some people say, well, Jesus laid down his life. Isn't that a suicide? No, he sacrificed his life. He was killed by others. Samson stretched out his arms, knocked down the building, and laid his life down. 
but he did it to defeat God's enemies from their people. It was more of a sacrifice. So difficult question. Hope that helps a little. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Let's see our next question. And this is a question that's come from Freehold in New Jersey. What is the biblical reason not to go to theater or movies? Or you might be wondering, is there a biblical reason? Well, uh, our family as a practice does not go to the theater or movies, and it's not that there is never a good production of a, a DVD or some program out there. We're producing some programs right now. How many of you like orange juice? Anyone like orange juice? I had to word it that way. Okay. Do you buy your orange juice at a bar? Can you get orange juice at a bar? Trust me, I know you can. I used to drink. They use it to make screwdrivers. But I don't buy my orange juice there anymore because I'm a Christian and it's too expensive. It's also too expensive and it's a bad environment. Most of what they show in the typical theater these days is not G-rated, family, and appropriate. As a matter of fact, you can take most of the popular movies based on the principles we laid down of purity and nobility and true last night. Not many good things out there. And so you're going to pay too much. It's not a good witness. And uh, it's probably not a very good environment. So those are some reasons, I think, if there is something good, that rare thing that's produced that's good, wait until it comes out on DVD for one dollar, the whole family can watch it. All right, well, Pastor Doug, I think we have one more question that okay. we can take a look at. And the question is, if you keep falling into the same sin and you repent, will God still forgive you? Oh, this is very important. You know, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I bet everybody here can relate to that. You make a mistake, you're sorry, you tell God, you ask Him to forgive you, He forgives you, you feel better, then you do the same thing. And you come back and you knock on heaven's door and you say, Lord, I know you hate to see me coming again, but I did it again. You know, it's that way with gossip. Sometimes we feel bad when we gossip, say, Lord, help me, I'm sorry, forgive me. And do you know, you turn around for two hours go by and you do it again. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry, please help me. And then you do it again and you think, Lord, I'm not even going to bother you anymore because you're probably tired of seeing me come with the same sin, asking for forgiveness. Wrong. God will not get tired of forgiving you as long as you are sincere about being sorry. Mm -hmm. What typically happens though is we presume on God's forgiveness and we start taking it for granted and it can get to the place where um, we can lose our capacity to be sorry for that thing. But don't think that God is tired of seeing you sincerely come to Him for repentance. You know, we may often have to weep and kneel at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I made the mistake again. Mary Magdalene, the Bible says, Jesus cast seven devils out of her. And that's seven different times she came. She had fallen back into the old behavior. God is long-suffering to us. He loves you. How often will a parent forgive their child? Look how patient our parents are. God loves you more than any earthly parent. If you make the same mistake again and again, keep coming. You know how many times I quit smoking before I quit smoking? Who was it? Mark Twain that said, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it a hundred times. <laughs> It's staying quit, but I finally did quit for good. So I'm so thankful that I didn't give up on God and He didn't give up on me. Don't get discouraged with yourself. Amen. Time's Thank up. you, Pastor Doug. I'm sorry I went long. That's it's all right. Big subject. If you have a Bible question, you can go to the MIQ Teens website. You can post it online. Pastor Doug, time is yours. Thank you very much, Pastor Ross. You know, he's a pretty good racquetball player. We played today. He hits the ball so hard that it breaks. We flew out here. We just didn't bring enough. Anyway, to our lesson for tonight. Did you know that you experience life in your body? And if you take good care of your body, you'll enjoy your life more. Last night we talked about your thinking, the inside, your mind, purity of heart. Tonight, with the help of God, we're going to cover a broad spectrum of issues dealing with what does the Bible say about how I can take care of my body so I can enjoy an abundant life? 
and you pray for me because I got a lot of things to talk about and I'm going to be very honest with you and share with you from my personal experience what I've learned, some things the hard way about taking care of our bodies. Why don't we start with just talking about something basic like eating. Now eating is something that we all do. I'm assuming most of us do it, right? But there needs to be even some self-control and there are some Bible guidelines on what to eat and how to eat and to do it for, uh, for strength and for health. Question number one in our lesson. Let's go there. Does God really care? Does it matter to God what I eat? Well, you know, it tells us in 1 Corinthians, whatever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. We've got another verse here from Genesis 1.29. It gets into some of the specifics. God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed was on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Now the original diet for man was what you would call a vegetarian diet. It was fruits, grains, nuts, beans, vegetarian diet. Later after sin, God then added vegetables. Now I want to tell you from personal experience, my body is exhibit A of an experiment. I know that scares you. But I grew up eating all of the wrong things. I have eaten everything and anything that could crawl across your plate. Matter of fact, rich people, my dad was a, a millionaire and they'd take us out to these fancy restaurants and I've eaten snails, I've eaten frogs, I've eaten turtle steak, I've eaten catfish. I, we used to catch them in our backyard. I've eaten rattlesnake, though I didn't get that in a uh, squirrel. I mean, I could go down the line. Ants, all kinds of things. And growing up, now that was kind of rare. I didn't do that every day. And growing up, I'm ashamed to say my breakfast for a good part of the time was a Twinkie and a cup of tea. And I wondered why I went to 14 different schools. I did so poorly. I was just bouncing off the walls the first period and then I'd have, I'd crash, you know, when all the caffeine wore off and all the sugar wore off and then I was depressed and I couldn't perform and, and uh, it finally, I moved into the hills when I became a teenager. And because I had no refrigeration, I didn't have enough money, I started eating a simple vegetarian diet. I started feeling like I'd been born again. My mind was clear. I could think clearly. I wasn't going through these cycles of ups and downs and depression. I felt so much better. My endurance was better. I was getting fresh air, sunshine, exercise. And I felt great. Then I moved back to the city. And of all things, it's a long story, I got involved in a meat business where I sold steak. And I started eating steak three times a day because I had the best cuts for myself. I was eating New York steak for breakfast and T-bone for lunch and filet mignon for dinner and I'd top it off, and I'm not exaggerating, with a half gallon of ice cream. You know, it's amazing what you could eat. Teenagers, their stomachs, I think, are that big. And I felt awful. And then I started studying into it and I went back to the diet I had when I lived up in the mountains and I've been on that ever since and I feel a lot better. For a guy with six grandkids, I'm in pretty good shape. And so um, I've learned some things. The original diet that God had really will promote a long life. It's a it's pretty well established fact now that vegetarians live longer. Is that just that simple? By the way, some of the greatest athletes in the world, I got a few facts here that I saw. You've heard of Dave Scott. He holds the record for the most Iron Man World Championship victories. How many of you know what the Iron Man competition is? That's where you run. Let me see. Uh, 2.4 mile swim. That's a long swim. 112 mile bike ride topped off with a 26 mile marathon run. And this fellow who was a vegetarian has won it six times. He tried it one more time in his 40s. Came in second place. That's phenomenal when you think about it. How many of you have heard of Carl Lewis? The Olympic champion who won, uh, what was it, seven? No, ten Olympic medals over his career. Nine of them gold medals. His best year, he said, he adopted not only a vegetarian but a vegan diet. And so following a Bible pattern, and the Bible doesn't say it's a sin for you to eat meat or dairy products. I personally think you're better off just from my experience and, and a lot of data supports that. But um, if you're going to be eating meat, the Bible specifies what kind of animals they should be. You can read, for instance, in Genesis 7 verse 2, it, when they went on the ark back in the days of Noah, 
It says, you'll take with you seven of every clean animal, a male and his female, and two of the animals that are unclean is male and his female. The clean animals were taken by sevens and the unclean by twos. Now, that's because Noah was Jewish and he just wasn't allowed to eat kosher food and so they took extra clean animals for him to eat. Was Noah Jewish? Here related to Noah, I just want to check. You know, we're all cousins, aren't we? Through Noah. And it did him pretty good. I mean, he lived 900 plus years. The original diet for man was not only a vegetarian diet, but God said you should only be eating, if you're going to eat meat, the animals that are clean. And so God gave some criteria. And the Bible outlines, and it's in your lesson book, what are the clean and the unclean animals. Some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor Doug, doesn't the Bible say that if you pray, God will sanctify what you eat through prayer? And I've got some dear friends that believe that. But you know what? I'll ask them. So you mean to tell me that it doesn't matter what you eat, that you could eat, it doesn't matter how much sugar, how much cholesterol, how often, how frequently, you just pray and it's all of a sudden good. Well, yeah, God says it's sanctified by the Word of God. So if your children, before they go to school, fill a bowl with Count Ch Chocula and then begin to heap the sugar on their Count Chocula and then they begin to pour some uh, chocolate syrup on top of that, and you say, whoa, wait a second, let's not get carried away. And they say, but I'm going to pray before I eat it. No parent would accept that. Obviously, it's going to have an effect. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating sweets a little bit. The Bible says, eat honey for it is good. Don't eat too much honey lest you vomit. So these things, you know, you need to use common sense and do things in moderation. Also, when you eat, eat for strength regular times, if you're kind of just noshing all day long, your, um, your stomach doesn't get to rest. I have found that, you know, I feel so much better. I wish I knew when I was younger what I know now. I think it probably would have added several years to my life. I just eat principally two real meals a day. I just had a few grapes and a granola bar before the program because I'm still in California time. And, you know, I feel good. And then you get exercise. You got to balance that with, you got to get some good vigorous exercise. Now, the reason I'm spending some time on this today, you know what the number one killer is in North America? It's not starvation. You can sum up the number one killer to not a lack of food, but too much food. We are living in one of the only generations in the history of mankind where more people are dying from abundance. There are so many things to eat and there's so many refined foods and there's so much sugar in the food and you know, even childhood obesity is epidemic, which is leading to heart disease, cancer, diabetes, stress, and you name it, the whole gamut of diseases can be traced to eating too much and the, of the wrong things and not getting enough exercise. A sedentary society, sometimes the only exercise we get is the remote control and the mouse, right? And then we eat, study. So having regular times to eat and eating the right foods and soda pop, you know, it's just liquid candy. Do you all know that? That's one of the biggest offenders. And I'm not saying it's a sin. You understand? But you got to realize what you're putting into your body because your body is the temple of God. You'll feel better. You know what? Let me just, I'm going to cut this whole section short just by telling you something real quick. What are some good reasons, seven reasons to take care of your body? Be careful what you eat, your exercise, what you drink. Number one, you'll serve God more efficiently. And that's the best reason because you love the Lord and you want to serve Him. Number two, you'll serve your fellow man better. Number three, you will feel better. Number four, you'll look better. That's right. The older you get, the more responsible you are for the way you look. Number five, you'll have more money. Why? Spend less money on junk food and less on doctors? Groceries? Number six, you'll live longer. Number seven, you will be more intelligent. You ever read that chapter in Daniel chapter one where Daniel and his friends made some decisions not to eat the Babylonian food, but they were going to eat uh, basically a vegetarian diet. And after they were tested, they were 10 times wiser than all the wise men in Babylon. And they had a lot of wise men in their kingdom back then. So the Bible principles are 
it does matter what you eat and what you drink. Do it all to the glory of God. Eat for strength, the Bible says, and not for drunkenness. You'll feel better. You'll look better. You'll, you'll live longer. You'll have a more abundant life. So I just wanted to mention a few principles, basic broad principles you find in the Bible about taking care of yourself. Number two, what does the Bible say about alcohol and drugs? Now, someone's probably thinking right away, well, doesn't Jesus, didn't he turn the water into wine? That must mean it's okay. Let's read this here from Proverbs chapter 23, verse 31. It says, Do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last it will bite like a serpent and sting like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. You can also read in Proverbs 20, verse 1, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now again, I am sorry, but I got to tell you, I know what I'm talking about. My father had a bar in his house when I was growing up. My mother, first time, my first exposure to uh, drugs was provided by my mom. I'll maybe share more, more about that in another program. I grew up surrounded with it. And I was drinking. I don't remember how young I was when I started drinking. My parents served him to me as a child as far back as I can go. I used to go around and clean out my dad's martini glasses when he would drink himself to sleep. Alcohol kills more young people than any other drug, all the other drugs combined. Now, I'm not justifying any of them. But what scares me is every now and then I meet Christian young people and they say, well, oh, nothing wrong with a little alcohol. Jesus turned the water into wine. That is a myth that it was alcoholic. Jesus saved the best for last and it doesn't mean the stuff that was strong proof. He gave them new wine at a time when it was unusual. Matter of fact, at the Lord's Supper, unleavened bread, unfermented grape juice. Jesus said, Matthew, oh, is that chapter 26? I will not drink it again until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. New wine in the Bible was unfermented. Jesus would never make, what was it, 60 gallons of booze for a party. No, everything. Matter of fact, think about this. If you want to know how Jesus feels about drugs, the salvation of our entire planet hung in the balance as Jesus was on the cross. The devil wanted to do something to get Jesus to sin. And one of his last desperate attempts was they soaked a sponge in some alcohol and they put it on a pole up to him. Maybe if he drank and was a little inebriated, he would curse God or do something wrong. He refused it. When he, a lot of people would think, boy, boy, if you ever needed some drugs right now for the pain, that would be a good time. But he wasn't going to jeopardize our salvation by fogging his mind with a drug and he turned away from it when it would have relieved his pain. The Lord wants us to have our minds clear. And so, do I need to go through all the drugs? I smoked a lot of pot. Used to grow it. I drank a lot of alcohol. Used to make my own beer. I learned how to do it at, at a boarding school one time. I won't tell you what the recipe is. <laughs> LSD, cocaine, I never did use heroin. I saw what it did to my friends in New York City and it was very <laughs> pathetic. But I went through the whole gamut of drugs and you know what? All of my friends that did that, they've either, they're dead in prison or they became losers unless they got the victory over that. I think it's clear to everybody here, drugs is just not the way to go if you want to take care of your body. I'm here and we got a text question that's coming in. So we're going to go to the screen and see what somebody's got on their money. It says, is it a sin to drink energy drinks? They are so tasty. <laughs> well, you know, they wouldn't be able to market it if they didn't find a way to make it. If it, it tasted disgusting, they wouldn't sell them, would they? Of course it's tasty. You know, what they're finding out is a lot of young people are getting so wound up on these energy drinks. I've been reading some interesting things that some are even having car accidents because they get so hyped on them that finally when they do come down, they actually black out. And others are becoming very irritable in class. They get to, and they're pulling knives and they're finding out that they were so tanked up on that stuff, it was like speed. And then when the caffeine effect stops, 
It often leads a core. You can't take money out of the bank and not pay the piper. And so if you take some kind of drink or something that's going to give you a surge of energy, you are going to have a corresponding low. The tide is going to go out. And if you have the tide come in a little extra far and you say, hey, this is great, I feel a rush, tide's going to go out a little further. And so you're never really coming ahead by doing those things. Best way if you want good energy is get the exercise, eat good foods, your body will stabilize the chemicals, and you'll find out when you're awake, you're clear. You feel that energy. Your mind is fresh. So, by the way, anything that can become addicting is not good for you. You ever heard of somebody getting addicted to bananas? And you're talking to your friend and they're looking real edgy and shaking in the class. And what's the problem? Give me a banana, quick. I gotta have a banana. I'll pay you whatever you want. Doesn't happen, does it? Nobody ever, what's the matter? Ah, Brussels sprouts, give me some Brussels sprouts, quick. <laughs> People get addicted to what's bad for them. Isn't that right? And so, any of these drugs, that ought to tell you something right away. They're addicting. All right, question number three. What can I do to increase my mental and physical strength? First Peter chapter 5 verse 8. The Bible has some sage advice for that question. Be sober. Be vigilant. Whenever you find the word be in the Bible, just remember this. God created the world by saying, let there be light. Let there be water, land, whatever it was. He spoke, and when he said be, it happened. Man came to Jesus one time, said, Lord, I'm a leper, but if you want, you can make me clean. And the Lord said, be clean. He was cleansed. So when God says in his word, be sober, if you're struggling with some kind of addiction, you think there's no hope for me, if God says be, you can be. It's true, friends. Be sober. Be vigilant. That means be on your guard because your adversary, the devil, is walking. He's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. And you know how the devil is devouring a whole generation of young people? Through drugs. That's why God says be sober. If your mind is clear, by the way, before I leave this subject, I'm going to talk a little bit later about sex and dating and some of that stuff. Why do you think guys will often try to get a girl to drink a little bit when they go out on a date? Is that so her moral resolve will be strengthened? Or do they know very well that their moral resolve will be weakened? The devil knows that too. Our moral fortitude, our power, our intellect to resist temptation are, is eroded by drugs. Matter of fact, even eating well will give you more power to resist temptation, taking care of your body. When did the devil come to Jesus to tempt him? After fasting 40 days when he was hungry in the wilderness, low blood sugar, tired, the devil came at him then. So the devil tries to get us when we're weak and tired or under the influence. And that's what drugs will do to you. So be sober. Be vigilant. All right, question number four. Can I do whatever I want as long as I'm being moderate or balanced? You know, a lot of times when someone's approached about, you know, biblical standards of godly living, they'll say, well, you know, you need to have balance. And what they mean by balance is they said, you need to just, you know, balance a little bit of drugs with a little bit of sobriety. And you need to balance a little bit of adultery with a little bit of morality. And you need to balance, and their idea of balance is you balance your sin with your episodes of obedience. That's not what the Bible means when it talks about balance. You do need a balanced life. But balance would be, you don't want to spend all day studying. Study's good. You want to balance your study with exercise. You don't want to spend all day long talking to your friends and not do any work. Friends are good and you need to do that, but you want to balance that with being industrious and doing your work. So yes, a Christian should be balanced, but don't ever use that word balance as a code word for mixing in a little bit of sin so you're not too godly. That's not how God uses it. But yes, we should have lives that are balanced, and that'll add balance to your life through Christ. All right, question number five. Does it really matter to God what I wear? I always enter this subject with fear and trepidation. What does the Bible say? First Peter, talk about our bodies, including what you put on them. First Peter chapter 15, verse 16. But as he who has called you is holy, 
so you should be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy. There's that word again, be. Be holy, God says, for I am holy. Is God calling us to be holy? Is that scripture clear? He's saying, be holy. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll empower you. You know, the Lord will never, ever, ever ask you to do something without giving you the power to do what He's asking you to do. Wouldn't that be cruel? If a parent said to some child, look, I want you to run over there and turn that light on, but the light's over the child's head. He says, well, the kid's jumping up and down. Says, I can't reach it. Father comes over and smacks him to the ground and says, I told you, turn on that light. Wouldn't that be cruel? Is God going to punish us for not doing something that we are incapable of doing? Every time, it's encouraging. Every commandment of God should make you happy because that means you are able to do everything He's asking you to do. How much can you do through Christ? All things. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about clothing. Does it matter what we wear as Christians? Why do we wear clothes at all? I lived, uh, as you have told you, I know what I'm talking about. I bet not too many of you can say that you went a year without clothes. I can. I lived up in the hills and I just ran around in my birthday tuxedo most of the time. <laughs> and you know, first time I did it, I said, you know, this isn't right. I grew up like you wearing clothes, but I, I was with the hippie movement back then. I thought, I'm going to find God through nature, you know, and I thought, <laughs> this is natural. And so I just took off all my clothes and, and, um, and you know, I wasn't the only hippie that would be up in the hills like that. Every now and then I'd run into somebody else and they didn't have their clothes on sometimes too. And I want to tell you right now, it's really hard to talk to someone else that's naked and act like you don't notice. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd be hiking down the trail and all I had, I always wear my boots. I had my hiking boots because they were cactus up in the mountains. And I, and I had a little backpack and I'd just be hiking around the mountains up there just naked. And sometimes I'd run into other people. They were usually hippies. And they'd try and act like, hey, yeah, hi, how you doing? And they try and act like they don't notice, you know. Or, and you know what? I just want to tell you right now, it ain't right. It just, it's not normal. You know, every animal is born with clothes on or they grow from the inside out. Humans are the only creature that sort of puts their clothes on from the outside. In the beginning when man sinned, when we were made, we had robes of light. Adam and Eve had uh, glorious robes of light. And when they sinned, the light faded and they saw each other's nakedness. And then they went, they said, this is embarrassing. They even, they were married. They said, this ain't right. They went and found fig leaves. And God said, no, nah, guys, fig leaves aren't going to work. You don't know this yet, but they're going to shrivel. Nothing had died yet. And he had to sacrifice some lambs to cover their skin. By the way, Adam and Eve, it says, they made aprons of fig leaves. So they were wearing the little cooking aprons. And God said, no, nah, the fig leaf miniskirts aren't going to do. And it says, he gave them tunics, robes of skin. Something had to die to cover them. It's a whole other story, but that represents Jesus died to cover our nakedness. By the way, you know the only thing Christ left behind in this world was a blood-stained robe, and that was all left for you and for me. So when you think about why we wear clothes, the reason we're doing it is, first of all, modesty. If it got really hot in here, I hope that you're not going to all start throwing your clothes off. We wear it for protection. If it was too cold, we want more clothing. Clothing also sometimes represents a uniform, your status and things like that. But for a Christian, there's some principles in your clothing. You want it to be neat. You want it to be clean. You want it to be modest. Styles change, but you don't want it to be revealing for the purpose of advertising. Now, the styles in our culture today, it kind of goes to the extreme of that, doesn't it? And so there should be a principle. You don't look at the world around and say, you know, every new fad and fashion that comes along, that's what I'm going to follow. Christians in their clothing should be modest. It should be appropriate. It doesn't have to be the cheapest clothes. You don't have to wear bags. I think it's okay to buy quality clothing. By the way, Jesus' robe, it says, was so nice they decided not to tear it up. They said, hey, this is pretty good quality. We'll clean the blood off. Let's gamble, see who gets it. And so Jesus had a nice robe. But... Um, those are just some basic principles. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. It says, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not what is unclean, and I'll receive you. And so the Lord is asking us to be a little different. Christians are called a peculiar people. That doesn't mean you need to dress peculiar. But you know, 
how do I say this to you? I remember one time I was in a restaurant. I was talking to a Christian friend. And the waitress came over to us. And she was wearing that waitress uniform they wore in that restaurant. She took our order and she left. And I said to my friend, I think she's a Christian. He said, I was thinking the same thing. And she came back, brought our order, and I, we said, are you a Christian? She looked a little embarrassed. And she said, well, she wondered why we're asking. She said, well, yes, I am. She said, why do you ask? We said, you just look like one. There was something about her. She not only was, you know, she wasn't all duded up and she looked simple and clean. She had a glow of happiness and peace about her and cheerfulness that we just knew. And Christians ought to carry themselves that way. And everything about who you are, when you love Christ, you are, uh, you are walking advertisement for Jesus. You're called to be a witness. So it does matter, you know, not only what you eat and what you drink, but even what you wear. You want to take care of your bodies. All right, by the way, a little practical tip. You don't want to wear something that's so tight you can't breathe and or, you know, run or something like that. Your, your clothes ought to, ought to fit... Uh, Oh, uh, well, I'll get to that later. All right, question number six. <laughs> Is it wrong for me to keep up with current styles? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. He says, Do not let your adorning be merely the outward adorning, the arranging of the hair, the wearing of gold, or putting on a fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person in the heart, with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. You know, God is calling us to really the adorning ought to be the inner adorning. Now, we got a question in just a minute that's going to talk about tattoos and piercing, and so I, I, this sort of overlaps a little bit. Peter just addressed the, the wearing of gold, and someone no doubt is going to say, well, what about Christian jewelry, or you know, how much jewelry, or is it wrong to to pierce your body, you always want to ask, what would Jesus do? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we want to treat them that way. And so, that's that principle for simplicity. Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Now, the reason we included this scripture is because people sometimes can deliberately dress to try to accentuate their curves, their sexuality. That is a big thing in our culture. Matter of fact, if one girl comes up to another girl and says, oh, nice outfit, very sexy, it's taken as a compliment. Am I right? But, you know, the Bible says that if a man looks on a woman to lust in his heart, he, adultery begins in the mind, and it can happen with a looking. We all know the story about King David looking off his roof and seeing Bathsheba bathing, and just from looking, he invited her home, and it turned into adultery, and then it turned into murder, it turned into the death of four of his sons, and it started with a lustful look. And then you've got a good story about Joseph, who... This woman, wealthy woman, throwing herself at him, and he said, I'm not going to sin against God. And he ran away from her so that he wouldn't be tempted. The Bible says flee from temptation. Now, girls are, you know, girls can be attracted visually, uh, not exactly the same way as the mind and chemicals in a boy and how he operates. But boys are attracted, especially to something about the curves in a woman's figure. That's why guitars are curvy. You don't ever say something square is sexy, do you? <laughs> right? If you say a sexy sports car, it's usually it's got the curves. And I don't understand. It's kind of a miracle how God designed that, but if it is a sin for a man, let's just pick on the boys for a minute, to look upon a girl and especially be distracted by her accentuating her attractive curve or the... But you get the idea. <laughs> then what if a girl deliberately is dressing to see how many guys she can make stumble through the day? 
So you might have one guy that's looking and he has to go home and repent and that one girl could be strutting around campus and making lots of guys stumble in their hearts in their relationship with the Lord. Why would you want to do that deliberately? And guys, it goes both ways because girls also, you know, can be attracted. And there's a, there's a place for that and it's in marriage. So it does make a difference what we wear. Is it wrong to follow a style? Styles change. And, you know, there's a lot of styles that are probably harmless in themselves and, and I'm always way behind trying to catch up and figure out. My wife and, and my mother-in-law and others are saying, uh, Doug, we bought you clothes because I, I scare them sometimes when I dress myself. I have no sense of taste. But, um, you know, so it's not that every new style is bad, but you want to apply the principles of modesty um, that you can represent Jesus and I've said enough about that. We're going to move along. What does the Bible say about tattoos and body piercing? Talking about our bodies. Now, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Scripture is clear enough all by itself. Leviticus 19.28, can this be misunderstood? You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you, for I am the Lord. Even back, tattooing goes back to the history, early history of man. And um, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Is it just my imagination or has, have more and more tattoo parlors been springing up everywhere and everybody's getting tattoos? And, and I think it's so sad, frankly. And I'm not here to criticize people who have done that. God can forgive you. He loves you. You can have some of them removed. There'll be people in heaven with tattoos. Do you all hear me? I'm not consigning if you've gotten a tattoo. That person's going to hell. I'm just telling you, God says not to do it. Why? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What would you think? You have this beautiful, marble, white, pure temple. And then all of a sudden some kid looks over his shoulder both ways and he runs up with a can of spray paint and he paints a dragon on it. That's, you know, it's kind of defacing something. It's called vandalism. It's a crime. Your body is made by God. Now we talked about tattoos. By the way, I don't know anybody who has had a tattoo for 30 years that if they couldn't get rid of it, won it. If they could wish it off, they'd probably be thankful to get rid of it. There may be some out there, but you know what? And as the older you get, those tattoos, they kind of run and they fade and they all sort of look like antique maps after a while. And you, what does that say? What is that? And it's kind of sad. You got that on your body forever. And, all right, enough said. Cuttings in our flesh. Now, I guess I was one of the last ones to hear that that's a real problem principally among girls, but also among boys where they, they cut themselves. And that is connected with piercing to some extent. We're all aware of that. You know, in the Bible, when people worship the devil, you can find examples where they would cut themselves. You read about the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal in the book of uh, 1 Kings. And it says that when the prophets of Baal, these pagan prophets, wanted to get their pagan deity, to get their, his attention, they leapt on the altar, they took lances, and they cut themselves until they bled. You can read about this demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5. It says, always he was going about in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself. And so this obsession with piercing and cutting our bodies that's, what would Jesus do? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And in case you didn't know it, God spent a lot of time on the drawing board designing your body perfectly with the appropriate number of holes. He didn't plan on you to add your own later. He gave you the right number to begin with. Right? We shouldn't add to that or diminish from it. So, Enough said on that, I suppose. Number eight. Why should I wait until marriage to have sex? There it was, that word. Now, you know, I, I'm praying about how much to say. Maybe I'll say it this way. Um, I wish I could go back in time. I went to military schools and all the boys talked about was girls. 
and I didn't believe in God and I had this crazy idea that people were like salmon. The purpose for life was you had to spawn before you died. Kind of pathetic when you think about it. The whole purpose was sex. And I thought the sooner the better. And the more the merrier. You know, guys like to brag about uh, their, their list of, of conquests. But, you know, once a person becomes a Christian and guys and girls, invariably they say they wish they could go back in time because they regret that they've given away something sacred that you can only have that one first experience with and it's supposed to be with your wife. I lived during that hippie area and I tell you there's just a lot of heartache. I don't know how far I should go talking about the um, my dear wife knew I was going to talk about this today. She sent me something that um, maybe I should maybe I should mention here some of these statistics about uh, there's an epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. I tell you what, let me, let me read this to you on a similar subject. Do you know the uh, largest consumer of internet pornography is teenagers, 12 to 17. The median age for the first use of pornography is boys, 11 to 13, and girls, they're only one year behind, 12 to 14. Pornography addicts, and by the way, this is Dr. Mary Ann Linden was speaking before the Senate committee, and it's an epidemic in our country right now, a billion, multi-billion dollar business, pornography on the internet. She said in some ways it is the most difficult addiction to recover from because at least with cocaine, tobacco, alcohol, you can get it out of your system, but with pornography, it stays in your mind forever. It is serious business. Now, I'm just going to talk to you heart to heart. I realize the sexual drive is a very powerful drive. God gave it to you, and He invented it, not the devil. It's a beautiful thing used the way God designed within that permanent relationship of marriage. Now, He also gave you the desire to eat, but there's a difference. They're both physical desires. You can go a little while without eating. Eventually, you'll die, but believe it or not, you can go the rest of your life without sex and you won't die from it. You might think you will, but you won't. It's an illusion. And you know what? I, I really feel sorry for you because it's so much worse right now in your generation than my generation, which is not that long ago because I have teenagers at home. When I grew up, we would every now and then see a fleeting reference to it. And if someone saw the centerfold of a playboy, we just thought that was scandalous compared to what is available to young people today and how our society is saturated and the sitcoms talk about sex like it's a shaking hands. Hi, what's your name? How are you? I'm pleased to meet you. You want to go to sleep together? And that's, it's treated as perfectly normal because we've all evolved and we're just animals, right? Isn't that what the culture is telling us? That's the devil behind that this whole philosophy that we're just animals and it's perfectly normal and just go with the flow and just see if you don't get caught. But, you know, there are consequences for that that affect you for the rest of your life and there's a whole gamut. I think there's like 28 different sexually transmis transmitted diseases that uh, you can get. Many of them are viral diseases and if it's a viral disease, there may be drugs that will subdue the uh, symptoms but you will, there's no drug to heal it. You know, back um, when I was growing up in the 60s, I think it was one out of ten teenagers uh, that were sexually active had a transmittable disease. But uh, today, it's one out of four of active teens. That's an epidemic. God has called you to holiness and purity. And He's asking you to trust Him. This whole idea, you're being bombarded by our culture with this idea that you've got to do and have everything now is not true. The greatest happiness is going to come in waiting. In waiting for that moment when the time is right and you've got the blessing of God on your relationships. Now we have another program where we're going to talk about relationships. But you know, I just wanted to share with you in closing the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, this I think is a very important verse, 
I beseech you therefore. That means he's like begging us by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. God doesn't want a dead sacrifice. He wants you to have an abundant life. He says, come to me just like you are. He says, I want to, I not only want your mind, I want your body. He died to save your soul. It's all of you that he wants. But you know, God's not going to force you. He's given you a mind, he's given you a will, and he has entrusted to your care for this life that body made in his image. Now how many of you would like a new body someday when Jesus comes? Would you like that? Then he wants you to take care of these temples that he's given you now. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you know, the Bible says, you honor that temple, he'll give you a new one when he comes back, a glorified immortal temple. But if we defile these temples, that's serious business. There's good news. We've all made mistakes in what we eat and what we drink and how we live and maybe what we think. Jesus said he can give you a new start. He can make you pure and forgive you. You can come to him right where you are and get a new beginning in your mind and in your body. Praise God that he heals our bodies. Amen? And I'd like to appeal to everybody here, those who may be watching, you can be a new creature through Christ in your mind and in your heart. Follow the Lord. Thank you for watching this episode of MIQ. During our next presentation, we will be discovering what God has in store for your future. See you then. This week's lesson is focused on Jacob, Israel. At one point, Jacob, the supplanter, had believed that he deserved all things to come his way. However, now, on his own and on the run, he realizes that they weren't his for the taking. The blessings were God's for the giving. And Jacob will learn this the hard way. First, let's go back to Genesis 28. Verse 10 says, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Verse 11, He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. Two crucial facts are mentioned in verse 11. The first one is a certain place and the other phrase the sun had set. On the first point, certain place, the word place is repeated five times in this chapter. It's the spot where Jacob spent the night. It is also referred to as the land, this land. And Jacob in awe of the dream about the ladder from heaven explained this place is none other than the house of God. This place is the gate of heaven. That's verse 17. He called the place Bethel, which means the house of God. He then makes a bargain with God in verses 20 to 22. And he departs. As he departs from that place, the Bible says that the sun had set. 
And so Jacob's journey out of the promised land is described here as walking into the sunset. And for the next 14 years, his life of toil and struggle will be as it was living in the twilight. His uncle Laban will deceive him, a painful reminder of his own deception. But God throughout these years will continue to be faithful to his promise. And he blesses him with children and herds of animals. Eventually, he ran away in fear of his father-in-law. But distress awaits him because Esau is coming with 400 men to meet them. His fear of him is palpable. And he turns to his only help. And in chapter 32 of Genesis, verse 9, Jacob on his knees prays, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, Yahweh, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. Verse 10 says, I am unworthy of all the loving kindnesses and all the faithfulness to which you have sown your servant. For my staff, only I crossed this Jordan. Now I have become companies. Verse 11, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Israel, for I fear him. Deliverance came in the middle of the night with a mysterious man who wrestled with him until daybreak. The man then blessed him and changed his name to Israel. The man said to Jacob, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with divine beings and human and have prevailed. The new name Israel, Yasha, describes his struggle to prevail. And it's crucial to note that this wrestling and prevailing took place just as the sun was rising. And so Jacob has moved out of his twilight years, is now on the promised land, and it's been given a new name. Genesis 32, verse 31, now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over that spot, and he named Peniel, which means, I have seen the face of God. I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Please also note the name Jacob, Yaakov, is not just supplanter, it also means crooked. However, the name Israel can also be read Yashael. The Hebrew word Yasha means straight, honest, honorable, law abiding. In biblical usage, it also means righteousness, God-fearing. The names in the ancient Jewish world carried a very important weight. A name spoke of a person's character, his deeds, his identity. And for a person to be given a new name meant a change in their identity. And thus, we begin to understand the meaning of this amazing transformation in Jacob's life. Israel is the one whom God makes straight as opposed to being crooked and uneven. In Genesis 33, we witness the beautiful scene of reconciliation between Jacob and Esau. Esau, who brought 400 armed men to this meeting, obviously didn't have a peaceful intention. Everything suddenly changed. During this encounter, they both wept, kissed, and reconciled. Then they began talking to each other. Beautiful scene. And note Jacob's speech. Go through it. Very polite. And God is mentioned in every sentence, while Esau doesn't mention God at all. 
the attitudes are completely different. While Esau says, I have plenty, Jacob states, I have everything. Esau speaks of wealth, while Jacob speaks of sufficiency. You see, Jacob has come a full circle. In Genesis 35, God calls him back to Bethel, where he exited last. At Bethel, he called upon his family, and I read verse 2 of chapter 32, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, purify yourselves, and change your garments. Verse 3, And I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the days of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have been. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, has become the God of Israel. What an amazing journey. What an amazing God. We are so glad that you joined us. We love 3 ABN Sabbath School panel. We love studying together and we love it that you are part of our family. Speaking of family, I have some of the family with me. We have all the brethren in Israel today. Mm. To my left, Pastor James Rafferty, glad you're here. Good to be here, Jill. I'm gonna be covering the brothers meet Esau and Jacob. Amen. To your left, Pastor John Loma King, glad you're here, Pastor. Yeah, pray for me on this topic. It is the violation of Dinah. Yeah. And it's a sensitive, touchy topic. Yes. It is a heavy I think topic. the way it's communicated will give context to oh, glory to God or so pray for guidance on this topic. Amen. Mm -hmm. To your left, Pastor Ryan Day, glad you're here, brother. Amen. Always a blessing to be a part of the 3AB and Sabbath School panel. And today I'm covering prevailing idolatry. And last but not least, Pastor John Denzi, always a privilege to open up the Word of God with you as well. I always, uh, I'm always blessed as I hear everyone share and I'm covering Thursday, this time the death of Rachel. Okay. Mm. Before we go any further, Pastor John already mentioned this, that we really need the Lord's guidance mm -hmm. in this lesson. And Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure. Gracious Father and loving Lord, we open the word, but we pray that we'll also open our hearts. Mm -hmm. Help us to be anxious for only one thing, to hear what the Spirit says to us and through us. We desire to make the lesson clear, mm -hmm. but we pray for guidance from above so that the outcome will be to st the strengthening of someone watching and the growth of those who are listening. Mm -hmm. And may we give all the glory to you, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Last week, lesson number nine was Jacob the supplanter. This is Jacob part one. We discovered that the deceiver became the deceived, mm -hmm. did he not? Jacob deceived his father into mm -hmm. obtaining the birthright. And then Jacob was deceived and he thought he was getting Rachel, the woman he loved, and he actually got Leah. Mm -hmm. We see this lesson is Jacob part two, you could say, Jacob to Israel. We're studying Genesis 32 to 35 and the saga picks up right after um, they have left Laban. They are traveling back to Canaan. This is Jacob with his 11 sons at that point and his two wives and their entire flocks and herds and everyone. I wanna ask you a question as we start. Why is the Bible so brutally honest and revealing the flaws of humanity. Mm. You know, I've wondered that many times when I read the Word of God. Why are the bad deeds recorded as much as the good deeds? This week, we're gonna discover that Jacob is terrified of the brother that he tricked 20 years ago, and he's terrified to come back home to Canaan. We're gonna discover that his brother Esau hated him and is coming to kill him. We're gonna discover that Jacob's daughter is raped as Pastor John is going to address and the brothers, Simeon and Levi specifically, wipe out an entire town in their rage or their desire for vengeance. We'll discover that there's still idolatry in Jacob's household. You know, I think the story is not so much about the faithfulness or seeming unfaithfulness of the man. The story is all about our covenant keeping God. Mm 
and the faithfulness of the God that we serve and how God orchestrates events to lead us to repentance because he desires that we would be saved in his kingdom at last. The word of God really, if you boil it all down, is it's about redemption. It is about salvation. Mm -hmm. That's what we find from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation is a God who loves his people and wants to save them. And that's what we discover this week about Jacob as well. Let's read our memory text. We're in Genesis chapter 32. We're going to look at verse 28. Genesis 32 verse 28. And he said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. On Sunday's lesson, we look at wrestling with God and I've divided the lesson into two portions. The first portion is the setup. And most of the setup is largely human work. There is a prayer in the middle of that. And then we get to the second portion of the lesson, which is the actual wrestle with God, Jacob's experience wrestling with God. So let's look at the setup. There's a lot of verses to read here. We're not going to read them all, but we will cover the concepts there. The setup, I have five steps that I found in the setup is the promise of peace, preparation for battle, prayers for deliverance, presence to pacify, and preparation for protection. So Jacob's afraid. He deceived his father. He deceived his brother. He's been separated for 20 years. He knows he's coming back. He knows that he's walking into a trial. And we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 32. I believe that Genesis 32 is a turning point in Jacob's life. Mm -hmm. Before this time, we see that he's really a bargainer with God, is he not? We see when right. he was at Bethel, what did he say? If you are with me, then I will do this. One of those conditional if-then statements. We see his bargaining with God. We see his nature of deception come forward. But here in Genesis chapter 32, we see a pivotal shift or a change in Jacob's life and in his character. Mm -hmm. So let's look at those five steps for the setup. First is the promise of peace. Jacob, first of all, tries to send messengers of peace. He has wealth, he has flocks, he has servants, he has herds, and he's seeking favor, as it were, with Esau. Mm -hmm. But what is the response? We see that in Genesis 32, verse six. The messengers returned, and what did they say? We came to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you, and 400 men, Ryan, are with him as well. Amen. So Jacob goes into step yeah. number two in the setup and he prepares for battle. He right. kind of strategizes. How am I going to save my family? What am I going to do to save my mm -hmm. family? And he divides them into two groups, does he not? Mm -hmm. He says the people, the flocks, the herds, separate them into two groups because if he gets one group, perhaps the mm -hmm. other group will escape. Then we come to the central point of this five-step process. I think it's the most important and it's the prayer. It's the prayer for deliverance. And if you analyze the structure of the prayer, it goes like this, A, B, C, A, it comes right back to A. Now A, Jacob reminds God of God's promise. We see that in Genesis 32 verse nine. Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. So what is he doing? He's praying the word back to God. He's mm -hmm. reminding God, this is what you promised. Mm -hmm. This is what you promised to my daddy and this is what you promised to my granddaddy. Mm -hmm. He's reminding God of the promise in his word. That's A. Then we get to B. Jacob acknowledges his need of God. Mm. That's the next verse, verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the, of the truth which you have shown your servant. We see Jacob has stopped bargaining with God and he recognizes his need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not worthy, right. I need you. Mm -hmm. Then we come to the C portion of the prayer. This is the next verse. Jacob is honest with God about his fears and about mm. the stuff he's struggling with. Verse 11, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. Mm. You know, God already knows your heart. Sometimes we think we got to be so strong in prayer. We got to, when we come to God, okay, God, I got it together. No, God knows you're afraid or God knows you're angry or God right. knows you're frustrated or he knows whatever you're dealing with. Be honest with him. 
Mm -hmm. Now the prayer, remember, was A, B, C. We come back to A because at the very end of the prayer, Jacob reminds God again of his mm -hmm. promise. We're in verse 12. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make mm -hmm. your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So it's like a sandwich and on both ends, mm -hmm. he prays the word back to God. Right. Step number four, we see the presence that he gives to pacify Esau. We won't get into it, but it was incredibly generous. Mm -hmm. All these animals and flocks and herds that he sent. And then we see number five, the preparation for protection. Jacob sent his two wives, the female servants, the concubines, the 11 sons over the ford of J Jabok. Mm -hmm. Is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. it? He sent them over for their protection, but Jacob remained alone on that side mm -hmm. of the river. And now we see the wrestling with God. We're in verse 24, Genesis 32, verse 24. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Who is this man? Mm. Hosea 12 says it was the angel. Joshua 5 says it was the commander of the Lord's army. Daniel 10 refers to it as the heavenly priest, Michael. Jacob later says, I have seen God face to face mm. and my life has been preserved. Mm. This is none other than the pre-incarnate son of God. Mm. Takeaway number one, when you reach the end of your humanity, God is there. Mm. At our weakest point, God shows up. Takeaway number two, I think this is significant. God initiated the struggle. You notice it doesn't say Jacob was left alone and he ran up to this man, God, and started wrestling with him. Right. Said um, man wrestled with him. There was a purpose in the wrestling mm. so that he could reach the end of his humanity. He could realize his need for God, his need for mm -hmm. dependence on God. Mm -hmm. It was for his character growth. It was for his redemption mm -hmm. and salvation. Verses 25 and 26. Now, when he saw he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, this is Jacob. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number three, your opponent is not always who you think. Mm -hmm. He could have thought his opponent was Esau. Esau right. is coming against him and he's terrified of his brother. He's coming with 400 men. Esau was not the barrier to entering the promised land. Esau right. was not the barrier to entering Canaan. Jacob's opponent was himself. By trickery and treachery, by cunning and deceit, Jacob had sought to obtain spiritual blessings through carnal means. Mm. And God was about ready to strip all of that away and show him his true heart and his need of God. Takeaway number four, God touches our strengths to show us how much we need him. Mm. Often we think we're attacked at the point of our weakest point. You think about in wrestling, the hips and legs, is where a lot of the strength mm -hmm. would lie. And he was touched in the hip. What does that mean? Often it's our strengths that keep us from surrender. Often it's our strengths that keep us from obedience because we think, I got it together. I can mm -hmm. do it myself. But it's in our point of strength where God needs to show us we're even weak where we thought we were strong. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number mm -hmm. five, victory is obtained through recognition of yourself and your insufficiencies, through the recognition of who your God is and your willingness to hang everything on his word and his promise. God's blessings are obtained when we cling to him yes. in helpless obe uh, right. obedience. And we say, I will not not let you go mm -hmm. unless you bless me. And then he says, what is your name? And Jacob said, my name is Jacob. I think stating of his name coincides with his recognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boy, I'm the deceiver. Mm -hmm. I was that guy. He yeah. recognized, acknowledged his sin. That's takeaway number six. And finally, takeaway number seven, allow God to change you. What did God do? Your name's no longer Jacob. Your name is no longer the deceiver. Your name is now Israel. Mm -hmm changing name recognized change of ownership mm. and change of the person's character and destiny. Jacob has finally reached the point where he is ready to be changed. And that's where our God can show up. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. Powerful. That was a great uh, setup for the Brothers Meet, which is Monday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty, and we're going to be looking at... Um, 
Genesis chapter, what chapter are we looking at here? Genesis 30, 30. chapter 33, 33, verses 1 through 20. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Genesis 33, 1 through 20. And we have here the outworking of everything that, that Jill has just shared with us. We have the outworking of this preparation that Jacob may, may, makes to meet his brother. And as he makes this preparation and he gains this victory over himself through um, the wrestling with Christ, the wrestling with the angel, um, everything else falls into place. And that's, that's what the Bible teaches us about this journey that we're on, this journey of salvation, that when self is dethroned, when self is defeated, when self is surrendered, everything else falls into place. And a lot of times we wrestle with sin and we wrestle with temptation yeah. with self all alive. And that's why <laughs> it's such a struggle. Because, you know, self just wants all of that. But once self is dethroned, there's, there's no struggle with sin, where there's no struggle with temptation because it's clamoring after someone who is gone, who's dead, someone who isn't answering the, the door. Mm -hmm. So Jacob, we pick the story up here in uh, Genesis chapter 33 in verse 1. Jacob lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, Esau came and with him 400 men. Mm. Mm -hmm. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and the two handmaids. So Jacob is going now from a place where he sees the face of God. That's Genesis 32, verse 30. Peniel, mm -hmm. the place where he had this experience with God. Jacob moves now to meet his brother. And, you know, there's been 20 years of separation. And when Jacob sees him coming with 400 men, you can imagine Jacob is worried because... The last thing that he remembers with his relationship with his brother was fleeing for his life. His brother was, had promised, I'm going to take you out. And so he prepares himself and his family. He starts dividing them up. He divides children, the children with, unto Leah and the children unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids, verse two, 2. And he put the handmaids and the children foremost, that is, uh, there's a succession here that is kind of revealing to us. I mean, when I think about our humanity, you know, yeah. we think about, um, I don't know, the best place, best way to illustrate this might be uh, when I used to eat uh, my food, I would always save the best for last. <laughs> so my mom would give me the vegetables, you know, and when I've got the vegetables on my plate, you know, I tried a few times to feed them to the dog. Um, under the table, but that didn't work because the dog didn't like him either. And so they ended up on the floor. My mom was really <laughs> upset then, right? So I would try to eat all the vegetables first. And then hopefully, you know, I could eat the rest of the meal and that would take the taste of the vegetables out of my mouth, save the, the best for last. It seems like that's what Jacob is doing here. He puts the handmaids and their children foremost in the front. Mm -hmm. Leah and her children, remember, Leah wasn't as loved as Rachel. Leah and her children after the handmaids. And then Rachel and Joseph at the very end, like the best for last. Like, <laughs> I want to protect them the best. And mm. he passes over uh, before them. Now, that's... To me, that's the redemption. We've just talked about how he wrestled with the angel and he prevailed and he's, he's become Israel now. So yes, we've got the handmaids and the children in front and yes, we've got Leah next and yes, we've got Rachel and Joseph behind. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Jacob goes in front of all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jacob's in front that's of all good. of them. And this is a picture really, if you will, of Christ. Christ right. has placed himself in front of all all of humanity mm -hmm. and he has taken the wrath of the enemy the wrath that really belongs to us mm -hmm. the wrath that we really deserve he's taking that all he's taking that on first mm -hmm. he's going to confront that first and what's really amazing and we see this in the story because it's a great illustration is Christ takes on the wrath of our enemy and there's nothing left for the rest of us mm. in other words Christ has taken out the second death That's right. for us mm -hmm. and those that trust in Christ will not be hurt the Bible says in the book of Revelation will not be That's hurt right. of the second death so you see an analogy here you see a picture here of the plan of salvation and you see Jacob putting himself in front of all of them he passed over before them and he bows himself to the ground the Bible says that Jesus Christ humbled himself in Philippians chapter 2. It says he bowed himself to the ground seven times. And if you follow Hebrews chapter 2 very carefully, you're going to find seven steps of Christ humbling himself down to the point of dying the death, even the death of the cross. So the type is here in Jacob. He bows himself to the ground seven times until he came near unto his brother. So Jesus came to this earth. He humbled himself. He came near to us. He became one with the human family. And what happens? 
Esau ran to meet him, mm. embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Hello, prodigal son, the return of the prodigal son. <laughs> so you see here in the picture of Jacob and Esau, you see again this picture of the plan of salvation. Yeah. You see the humility of Jesus Christ in our behalf to protect us, to redeem us. And then you see the response of the enemy of right. Jacob, or the enemy of humanity. You see that our enemies can be reconciled to us as we humble ourselves and reveal the character mm -hmm. and the spirit and the grace of Jesus Christ. And of course, this picture of the prodigal son is beautiful. And so verse five, he lifts up his eyes and he saw, this is Esau, he saw the women and the children. He said, who are those with thee? You know, because when Jacob left, he was by him. He was all alone, right. right? Who are those with thee? And he said, the children which God has, here's the word, are you ready for this? Graciously given thy servant. Mm -hmm. Oh man, well, if you remember our last lesson and you want to read Genesis chapter 29 and chapter 30, it was anything but gracious in a sense. I mean, all the and the envy and the jealousy and the hate that was going on there between Leah and Rachel, you know, and then the handmaids come into it because we don't want to be outdone by one of the others. And yet Jacob here in his converted transformed state says, these are the children which God has graciously given because in spite of the envy, in spite of the jealousy, God came down and he blessed. Yeah. He blessed right. Leah yeah. and he blessed Rachel and he blessed Bill. He blessed the handmaids. God blesses humanity even mm -hmm. in our dysfunction, mm -hmm. even in our failure. Failures. Then the handmaids came near and they and their children, they bowed themselves and Leah also with her children came near and they bowed themselves and after came Joseph near with Rachel and they bowed themselves and he said, what meanest thee this by all that drove which I met? And he said, I've sent these to find grace in thy sight, my Lord. This is amazing how Jacob is relating to Esau. And Esau said, I have enough, I have enough, my brother. Keep what thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, no, 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 I pray you, if I found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of of God. Now, mm -hmm. this is a really powerful point right here. Yeah. And, it, and even the rest of the, the outline here, we're not going to go through it all. Just grace, grace, grace all the way through it. But the quarterly brings out an important point here that I think we should really focus on in its application to the plan of salvation. Jacob bows himself seven times before his brother, whom he calls several times my Lord mm -hmm. and identifies himself as his servant. Significantly, Jacob's seven bows echo his father's seven blessings, which he had received, you know, in Esau's place. And furthermore, when he bows, he specifically reverses his father's blessings about the nations bowing to you. So it's as though Esau, Jacob is returning to Esau the blessings that he deceived and took and stole from Esau. That's, that's nice. And he is reversing the blessing or the uh, statement that was nations will bow to you. He's bowing to Esau. Jacob is bowing to Esau. It's as if Jacob's intention was to pay his debt to his brother, to return the blessing that he had stolen from him. So when Esau saw his brother against all ex expectations, he ran to Jacob and instead of killing him, <laughs> he kissed him and they wept. Hmm. Yeah. This is the power of grace. This is I the know. power of I reconciliation. Know. And then later Jacob comments and says, I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I struggled with this. What, what do we mean es Esau's the face of God? Jacob, aren't you going a little bit overboard here? I mean, aren't you really <laughs> trying a little bit too hard here to appease, right? But notice the point that the, the quarterly makes, and I think it's so good. The reason for Jacob's extraordinary statement is his understanding that Esau had forgiven him. Mm. Amen. The Hebrew word, ratzah, pleased, is a theological term referring to any sacrifice that is pleasing or accepted by God, which then implies divine forgiveness. Mm. Mm. So Jacob, Jacob was saying, I see your face as I see the face of the Lord because he had already experienced the forgiveness of the Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. And because Esau had ran to him and fallen upon his neck and kissed him, he was experiencing the forgiveness of Esau. And he says, this is just like the experience I had with the Lord. And so I see you as I see the Lord. And friends, really that's the bottom line for each one of us. God wants to be so gracious to us and touch our hearts with such power and love that people who see us, mm. especially people who perhaps are afraid of us, afraid because they've mistreated us, mm -hmm. would see in us the forgiveness of God. That's mm -hmm. why we're here on this earth. That's the purpose, that's the, 
the commission of the Church of Christ is to, through us, reveal God's goodness and God's grace and God's forgiveness. Amen. 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 I love oh. that, Pastor James. That's powerful. Forgiveness, healing, and reconciliation. Don't go away. We have so much more for you. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study of Jacob turned into Israel and we're going to kick it over to Pastor John Lobacane in Tuesday's lesson. Wow. One of the toughest chapters in the book of Genesis is mm -hmm. chapter 34. Mm -hmm. We've talked about deceiving mothers, biased parents, mm -hmm. brothers who are hungry and willing to give up what they could receive as a blessing from the father to carry out throughout their generation. We've, we've read about deception in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve being deceived. Now we come to a a part of the story, and I think there's a question that you asked earlier, Jill, mm -hmm. that really shows, and I think one of the reasons that I can cite that the Bible is not written by man is it points out the worst in us. Yeah. Mm. It points out the worst in us so that we can see the best in Christ. Amen. That's and great. so if you would ask, this, ask yourself the question, is there anything about us that's good? <laughs> Just read Genesis. You don't have to read the rest of the Bible. Right. Just Genesis establishes yeah. a cadence that the heart is deceitful above all things yeah. and Desperate. desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. And then it ends with the question, who can know it? Mm -hmm. And so this is one of those stories that it starts out by the land where, uh, where Jacob settles. And he settles among a people that he doesn't know as well. They are not committed to God. And it's a, a people based on what we're going to read here that have, um, that have no control in this particular story. Um, Shechem has no control of his faculties. Mm -hmm. And he allows his eyes to cause his flesh mm -hmm. to sin. And so we're going to walk through the story rather than just making points. I want to walk through it specifically because, um, and then I'll, at the very end of it, highlight uh, Simeon and Levi. But the violation of Dinah opens the door to remind us that um, this is not a new sin. Yeah. This has been going on for millennia. Uh, men, uh, unfortunately, exercise among many men uh, looking at the beauty of a woman and thinking that because she looks beautiful that he can take her by force mm -hmm. and think that his actions are justified by his passions. And the Bible mm. shows that um, not only in this story will you see that whatever you sow, you're going to reap, but you'll also see the aspects of how God looks at humanity that puts him or herself in this category. Today we have something in the world called human trafficking. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it falls in line with this kind of story. Uh, women being snatched and kidnapped and sold around the world and bartered as though they are a piece of property. Mm -hmm. And you will see in this story that God, that at a time where, and I, I say this, at a time where Jacob could have put his best foot forward, it's kind of, I ask myself the question, where was he when he could have done mm -hmm. more? Absolutely. So let's start with verse one to six, the violation of Dinah. We're going to walk through every verse in the story. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hiviite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And this part is not agape love. This is carnal love. Mm -hmm. And he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. That was more of a, that was more not, not speaking to her respectfully, mm -hmm. but speaking to her uh, 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 suggestively. Yeah. yeah, he said, you know, uh, nowadays we, in the city, when you're growing up in New York, they rapping to her. You know, how are you doing? You know, trying to find his way in, mm. which is a sad reality. 
And it says, goes, goes on, so Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying, get this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field and Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now at this point, I should have said, Jacob didn't have to wait till his sons came in. Mm -hmm. As a father, he, he should have taken the lead right here and called his sons in and say, here's what happened to Dinah. We need to take this matter into our hands and approach this family about what just took place. But he waited. And I think that hesitation to me, he held his peace. And I, I don't understand the reason why he held his peace, but the Bible says that's what he did. But this next part, uh, which it shows me that we should not look at women as comparable to property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's what this part says. If I could just give you some land, right. would this be okay? I mean, just, I just raped your daughter. I just raped Dinah. If I, if I give you this property, would that be cool? So look at this. It's, very, it's a minimization of her value. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this. Don't ever look at a woman regardless of what you think about her. Don't ever look at a woman as though her value is just comparable to something that can be traded for the violation of her body. Mm -hmm. Verse 6 to 12. It's a sad story. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak to him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke, to him, spoke with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter, right? trying, to, trying to fix it up. Mm -hmm. Please give her to him as a wife. Why, why couldn't you ask that before? Mm. And make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. Now he's expanding. <laughs> and take our daughters to yourselves, sons of God, daughters of men. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourself in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. In other words, whatever you want, you can have it, but I just want her. Mm. And this, this kind of, rather than any repentive spirit, even saying, you know, I am so repentant of what I did to your daughter. What can I do to show my repentance? He just went on to just property right. exchange. Yeah. Very sad. But look at the brothers. Verses 13 to 24. The frustration of Simeon and Levi. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke, deceit and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah his sister. And they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give you our sister. Give our sister to the one who is uncircumcised for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will trade your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us, if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughters and be gone. Now, I don't want to go through the rest of the story, but what they're in essence saying, and they knew in their hearts that this is not what they were going to do. They, they had other plans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they wanted to, they wanted to disseminate their, their anger among the entire uh, 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 group of people to, to cause them to go through these rituals just to, in some sense, as a demeaning act. Right. But they had no intention of allowing those actions to become equal payment mm -hmm. for the violation right. of their sister. And then we find the vengeance of Simeon and Levi, verses 26 to 29. And they, now, by the way, they, 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 they followed all the requirements, mm -hmm. but the Bible says in verse 26, and they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, their, their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field and all their wealth and their little ones and their wives, they took captive and they plundered even all that was in the houses. Mm. They said, we're going to rake the city. You did that to our sister. 
this is the vengeance. And you know, I don't agree with either side of that. Wow. Mm -hmm. But this act was so vengeful. That's why you find later on in Genesis chapter 49, it speaks of Simeon and Levi as instruments of cruelty. Mm -hmm. uh, Genesis 49, 49 verse 5, they were instruments of cruelty. But here's the part of the story that really bothered me. It seemed as though Jacob just kind of let it go because look at verses 30 and 31. Then Jacob said to Sim Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? That's what Jacob should have been saying. <laughs> Right. But he was more concerned about his reputation when he should have been <laughs> defending the reputation of his daughter. That's right. And the sons never, now I don't agree with their, their murderous uh, actions, but they had more compassion for what had happened to their sister right. than Jacob did. And I'll give my closing comments on the last two minutes. What a story. That is the reality that the Bible shows even the darkest side of humanity. Mm. Wow, wow. Whew, I almost need a moment just to, just to <laughs> get my thoughts together after that. It's, a, it's one of those stories it's hard to take in. But, um, but praise the Lord, we serve a gracious God. Mm -hmm. That even beyond our darkness and our frailties and, and our mishaps and all of our issues that we have, we serve a mighty God who is gracious and forgiving. And my name is Ryan Day, and I have Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled Prevailing Idolatry. And uh, I'm going to be jumping right into the first verse of Genesis chapter 35 because uh, this now, now there's about to take a, a, another, another turn, another change in the camp of, of Jacob. And I just have to ask this question. Does God accept us as we are when we come to him? Yes. yes, he certainly yeah. does. In fact, we hear that a lot. You know, God accepts you just as you are. And that is so true. We serve a loving, kind, gracious, wonderful God who accepts us just as we are. When we come to him with all of our problems, with all of our, our issues in our life and, and all of the backwardness from his character, he accepts us just as we are. But as we're about to read, he does not leave us and he is not, he is not determined to leave us the way that we are. God is a changing God. He is That's a right. transforming God. And so here are what we have in Genesis chapter 35. I'm going to begin in verse one. It says, then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, then let us rise and go up to Bethel and, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and in their earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the uh, terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which, that is Bethel, which is the land of Canaan. He and all the people were there with him and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the tabernacle tree. And so it goes on to say, so the name of it was called Elon Bakuth. The God appeared, then God appeared to Jacob again, and he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. You, uh, your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And so what we see here is that God, you know, he's dealt with Jacob, right? He's brought Jacob into, you know, he's had a personal experience. Jacob has had a personal experience with God, but now God is going to get the rest of the camp. And he's saying now, come back to Bethel, make an offering to me. But now we see here that Jacob tells the camp, he says, look, if we're going to go up and we're going to have an encounter with God, we're going to extend worship to God. We're going to be in God's presence. You got to make some changes. You got to change your garments. You got to get rid of these false idols because only God, him, we serve alone. So it's not enough to make a physical 
move from one place to another or from one church to another and expect God's blessing while there are idols still in our lives. That's the point we're going to bring from this. Mm -hmm. Some of us are still cherishing idols in our hearts and God cannot give us a new name as he did Jacob, okay. Jacob to Israel. God cannot give us that new name, that new uh, identification in him unless we surrender all to him. That's the purpose of these verses. Uh, it, it's not so much that we clean up to come to God, but rather God, when God calls us, he accepts us as we are, but yes, there is a cleaning process that God requires and that God will do in you and in those who are willing. I love Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Again, on this idolatry uh, theme, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Notice what the Bible says. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on these things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears and you also will appear with him in glory. And then notice verse 5 here. Therefore put to death your members which are of the earth. And then he gives the list here. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry. Because of these things the wrath of God has come coming up on the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. In this case, we know that God wants to, he wants to be the sole God in your life. Mm -hmm. He wants to be the only person, the only power that you idol. God is your God and nothing else. He is a jealous God and there will be no more other gods in your life if he is going to be in your life. That's right. Uh, you know, there's many different ways and I just want to kind of get practical here for a moment in the, in the remaining moments that I have. There's many different ways... Uh, uh, different aspects in which we allow idols to creep up in our life. And uh, I'm going to just, if I have time, I have about eight different aspects here that I want to mention that are, that's going to make it practical. That's going to make it meaningful for our time. Uh, I, the first one that came to mind as I was preparing this lesson was your identity. Some people allow their identity to become an idol. Yeah. You see, we have largely abandoned who we are in Christ and placed our identity in other things, whether it be our social media following, or our position at work or our abilities or our skills or the achievements we are after. Many have left their identity and, and they're wrapped up in the wrong things. Where is your identity? Is it in Christ? Is it in yourself? Is it in other things of the world? Where is your identity? Don't allow that identity become an idol and push you or draw you away from the Lord, but rather your identity in Christ alone is all that matters. The second thing, have you allowed money and material things, the things of the world, to become an idol to you. This is a big one. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 comes to mind when I think of this because it says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have astrayed from the faith, it says, and their, and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We live in a world today where people chase, that's what they live for. They live to make more money, more money, more money, more money. They want more wealth, more wealth. And this greed, this desire, this covetous heart has led them to idol the mammon of the world, the things of the world, the money, the material things of the world in which all is going to burn before Christ comes back. Where is your heart? Have you made that an idol in your life? Because I promise you, no matter how many mansions, no matter how many cars, no matter how many, uh, you know, how much, how much bling bling you may have on your body, when Jesus comes back, it's all gone. You're not taking it to heaven with you. The Bible makes that very clear. Do you allow your job, your status, your career to become an idol? Uh, lives and homes being destroyed because of selfish gain and status and over a title or career. It's so sad because we live in a world today where families are so segmented and broken and, 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 and torn apart because we have selfish individuals who are more interested and more into their career, their job. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that a career is bad to have. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a job. A man have to work, right? We have to pay the bills. But certainly don't allow that career, that job, that, that working status to become the idol in your life where that becomes the one thing that you give most of your time, your resources, and your love and your attention to when obviously God should come first, then family, and then everything else. Mm -hmm. Do you allow your physical appearance to become an idol in your life? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a big one. Uh, what, what, what do we see right there in the verses that we read in Genesis 5 verses 1 through 10 there? What, what, did, he, what did he address? Not only to, for them to put away their idols, but he said, change your garments. Mm -hmm. Take off your earrings, your jewelry, and all these different things. When you're going to approach God, God wants to make a change in your life. He accepts you just as you are, but he doesn't leave you as you are. 
Your heart, again, this is Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17, speaking from Lucifer's perspective. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Even the devil himself, the devil himself had more bling than anybody could ever imagine on all the face of the earth. And the Bible says all the precious uh, stones were his covering and it corrupted his heart because he made himself and his beauty, his appearance, an idol. Don't allow that to be you. That's right. Put God first. Entertainment. Has your entertainment become an idol? Social media, streaming services, sports, worldly concerts, music, all of these things. I'm not saying all of these things are bad in and of themselves, but at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we don't allow the technology and the entertainment, especially in today's time, to become an idol in our life. Did you know you could possibly make comfort an idol? While comfort is not a bad thing, it can be dangerous when it becomes our main pursuit of life. Mm. When comfort is an idol, we will struggle when God calls us to something more difficult. Is there a time of trouble coming? Mm -hmm. Is there a time of great testing coming? Absolutely. Where are you, my friends? Are you in Christ or is your heart somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this kind of earlier. It kind of goes along with entertainment, but also technology. Talking about computers. We live in the age of computers and phones and tablets. You know, addiction to screen time mm -hmm. when our lives revolve around how many likes we get and what, what our following looks like. And if we can't sit in silence for five minutes without refreshing our news feed, we might have a problem. <laughs> you know, these are issues we really have to take to the Lord. What is your, do you have an idol in your life? Seek the Lord, pray to the Lord and say, Lord, search me, O God, create in me a clean heart. Heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Thank you so much. What a blessing it's been so far. This lesson seems to have uh, flu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I have Thursday's portion. My name is John Dinsey, and the title for Thursday is The Death of Rachel, mm -hmm. and it's uh, in chapter 35, verses 15 to 29. Several events take place that have impacted the life of Jacob and his family. And among those, you see that Jacob's last son is born. Uh, a, a bitter experience, Rachel dies. Another bitter, bitter experience when Reuben, Jacob's firstborn son, sleeps with Jacob's concubine. Yeah. And uh, we won't have time to get to it, but the death of uh, Jacob's father, Isaac. Mm. Now let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 35, verse 14 and 29. Uh, beginning in verse 14, actually. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel, which means the house of God. Mm. Verse 16, then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth. And she had a hard labor. Verse 17, now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, encouraging her because she saw her sufferings, do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was that as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, which means son of sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. Hmm. Now, don't be shaken by this part here where it says, as her soul was departing, because this mm -hmm. uh, part soul here is the word nephesh, which is about 119 times is translated life. Mm -hmm. And we don't have time to get into this aspect, mm -hmm. but this is merely saying that in her dying breath, she called her son Benoni. As we continue here, uh, verse 19, so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Now, Rachel was the love of Jacob's life. Mm -hmm. Oh, he loved Rachel so much. The Bible says he worked 14 years just mm -hmm. to marry Rachel. And now, sadly, he has to lay her mm -hmm. in the grave and he set up a pillar to commemorate the place of her burial. And uh, they, they say that there's still some significance as to where she is buried. Now, you'll find interesting that in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 18, Rachel is mentioned again. It says, In Ramah was there a voice heard lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children mm -hmm. and would not be comforted because they are not. So Rachel is one of the uh, persons in the Bible that... Uh, has a prophetic significance. Now, when she was dying, it's interesting that she, you know, she said at one point to Jacob, 
give me children <laughs> or I'll die. Yeah. And unfortunately, giving her birth to her second son, she did die. A rather interesting mm. thing that takes place. Now, uh, Genesis 35, verse 21, we go to the next uh, event uh, described there. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Mm. And notice what it says. Mm. And Israel heard about it. <laughs> now, this is a rather interesting thing that happens here. And it's kind of mentioned like, a, oh, by the way, Reuben did this horrible act. And then it just moves on to another story. <laughs> now, the Bible doesn't just do that. Uh, okay. there, there are reasons why this is mentioned. And I'm going to bring out some things here that uh, you'll find interesting. Uh, when you get to Genesis chapter 49, apparently uh, here in chapter 35, Jacob just he heard about it and apparently did nothing. Or nothing is at least mentioned in chapter 35. But when you get to Genesis 49... Now here in verse 1, notice what is taking place. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Verse 3 and 4 is talking about Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Verse 4, unstable as water, mm. you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, you went up to my couch. You see, Reuben was uh, Jacob's firstborn. He had the privilege to be the firstborn son of Jacob. What does that mean? That means that he had the high privilege if he was faithful. Notice, if he was faithful to be in the lineage of the Messiah. And uh, notice what happens here in Matthew chapter 1. The lineage of Jesus is mentioned and Reuben should be in that list, but he's not. I'm just going to read verse 1 and 2. Um, Matthew, chapter 1, verse, Matthew chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, actually. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Tamar, and Pharaoh begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram. Uh, here, Reuben should have been mentioned, but he lost the privilege to be, uh, receive the blessing of the firstborn. Mm. And he's not in the lineage of the Messiah. And notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 4. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Is it possible that oh. Reuben should have been there? He lost the privilege to be the, receive the blessing of the firstborn son. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 236, it says the crowning blessings of the birth, birthright were transferred to Judah. The significant, significance of the name which denotes, pray, denotes praise is unfolded in the prophetic history of the tribe. He lost that privilege because of the crime he committed. Mm. The, uh, also in Patriarchs and Prophets 177, it says uh, they were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance. For it included not only the inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family. And in the line of his posterity, the redeemer of the world would come. Very important. On the other hand, there were obligations resting upon the possessor of the birthright. He should inherit the ble its blessings, must devote his life to the service of God. Like Abraham, he must be obedient to the divine requirements in marriage, in his family relations, in public life. He must consult the will of God. And so he lost that privilege because of that horrible crime he committed. Uh, now, uh, the book of Genesis chapter 35, beginning in verse 22, something marvelous happens. It just mentions the sons of Jacob <laughs> as he is he going back to his father's land. Very interesting because what happened to Jacob as he was leaving his father's? He left with a staff, probably some water and something to eat. But now he's returning with a huge multitude of people and great wealth. The Lord had, had blessed him mightily and uh, uh, he had repented. He had become, mm -hmm. he, his name was changed from yes. Jacob to Israel. And so it is that Jacob uh, was able to come into his father's house 
with great blessings. Now, uh, the last part of Genesis chapter 35 records the death of one of the patriarchs named Isaac. Beginning in verse 27, then Jacob came to his, father's, uh, I, to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kirjah Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Mm. Wow. <laughs> one of the last individuals in, in the Bible to live that long after the flood. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Mm. Isn't that wonderful that these two uh, sons of, of Isaac that were, you know, Esau said, I, I'm going to kill them, I'm going to kill them. But the Lord worked out the, the reconciliation of these two and together they were able to bury their father. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of lessons here in um, the book of Genesis from the stories. They're not just stories, they're not entertainment. Mm -hmm. They have valuable lessons. And we see here that some of the things taking place in the book of Genesis have prophetic significance. Mm -hmm. And so read them carefully, ask the Lord to give you understanding of what is there, to glean the lessons, not only to understand prophecy, but to help you, guide you in your life, because mm -hmm. those mistakes they made are there to be examples for us that we should be faithful to God instead of making these mistakes and then having to reap the bitter results of wickedness. Amen. Wow. Thank you all so much. It was a heavy lesson this week. Mm -hmm. To me, a wow. lot of it was heavy, but we see the consequences of sin, of walking in the way of our own choosing, but we see the blessing of God and the promise of forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation. I want to give each one of you a moment to share something about your day, Pastor James. Well, the, the lesson that we see with the reconciliation between the two brothers is the same lesson that Jacob learned uh, as he wrestled with the angel. And that was a lesson of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And that grace and mercy comes to us from God in an, a vertical relationship, but then it is to go out from us to others in a horizontal relationship. Amen. You know, thank you. When I think about the story of Dinah, a couple of thoughts came to my mind. When you read Genesis 34, verses 1 to 3, it says, uh, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, uh, went out to see the daughters of the land. And being the only girl in the family at that time, she may have dressed to fit into the crowd, but she was introduced to an environment as a 14 to 15 year old that proved to be too strong for her. And then you see the story says Shechem saw her, took her and lay with her and violated her. And when you study what commentators say about the situation, they say that this would be today what we might call date rape and not a violent rape as was the case with Tamar because later on Shechem expressed how much he loved her, tried to fix it with her family and Joseph consenting to the conditions didn't see this as a violent act. Here's a lesson, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good manners. Make good choices about your environment. Absolutely. You know, I mentioned that I had eight points. I, I listed seven. Here's my eighth <laughs> one here. You can allow possibly family, spouse and children mm. to become an idol in your life. Um, mm. Obviously we should love our family and our spouse, our children, but Matthew 10, Jesus says, he who loves father and mother more than he loves me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Put your, put your trust in God and put him first in every aspect. Amen, amen. Uh, concerning birthright, this is something marvelous. I found in letter four from 1898, Sister Ellen G. White says, Christ has brought within reach and secured for every man high and temporal and spiritual blessings. This is the birthright of every soul born into the world. If you are faithful, those blessings will be for you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Johnny, Ryan, Pastor John, and Pastor James. Thank you for sharing. I just want to leave you with one quote this time of Jacob's trouble that I had talked about. We will see at the end of time where you and I can reach forward and lay hold by faith on God and say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Amen. Join us next week, number 11, Joseph, Master of Dreams.
Putting God first can be difficult. What can we learn from Solomon, who refused to put God first? Everything started well for Solomon. The weight of the crown led him to ask for wisdom, the one thing he needed most. His request was fulfilled, and God also blessed Solomon's reign with wealth, health, and prosperity. In time, however, Solomon's wisdom turned into rationalization. He used his intelligence to rationalize why he broke many of God's established laws. Solomon used forced labor to build the house of the Lord, as that must have seemed more efficient. Solomon married princesses from many other nations so that he could forge peace treaties with his enemies. Solomon built altars to his wives' gods as a way of welcoming them into his kingdom. Solomon built his palace to be three times larger than the temple to accommodate his large household. God has given the laws that lead to long-term prosperity and peace, but Solomon used his intellect to bend them according to his pleasure. Solomon did not put God first, and Israel was divided into two kingdoms within months of his death. Today, highly intelligent people are still rationalizing the breaking of God's law and other of God's requirements, like tithing, for instance. Putting God first means taking His word seriously in all aspects and following it. The simplicity of a child following a loving parent's instructions is perhaps the best antidote to our own demise. God stands ready to open the doors to health, wealth, and prosperity to many of us, according to His plans for our lives. Sometimes God keeps a door shut because our faith and future would be compromised if we were to walk through it. God's faithfulness evokes our response as stewards. If we are faithful with the small things, God will put us in charge of greater things. Solomon refused to put God first. The consequences were terrible for him and the people around him. God's love compels us to put his kingdom first, while Solomon's example is a warning for us today. As we return our tithe and promise, we are challenged to put God first. Watches over me, you are for me. Grace loved me, and it's not what I deserve, and nothing that I've earned but daily. Grace saves me.
save me Embrace me It keeps me I'm clothed in
family, we join hands together. Lifting praises to the Father above for sending His Son. each evening. If you have been here four nights, be sure to pick up your hope for troubled times. If you are, have been here seven nights, and we, I hope you scanned in today if you've been coming regularly. If you're here for the first time, we're not doing new registrations today, but if you are here for the first time uh, and you just have come in today, there was no registration. But if you've been coming regularly, this book called Hope's End Time Secrets, Charts, Diagrams, Pictures about the Second Coming of Christ. You don't want to miss that. You can pick that up tonight. We are today having a very full day of preaching from God's Word, particularly the book of Revelation. And uh, this morning I'll speak on Revelation's most startling message. And then Pastor Wilson will be speaking on why are there so many different denominations. One God, one Bible but why so many different denominations? We know that this morning will be a great blessing, and then tonight, of course, our grand glorious climax, the day after tomorrow, or what heaven is going to be really like. Just now, we'll begin our meeting with prayer, and I'm going to invite Pastor Vic Van Schaik to come. Pastor Van Schaik is a godly pastor, an evangelist, a Christian administrator, responsible for churches here in the Indiana Conference. So, Pastor, pray for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. We're so thankful that we can come here once again this morning to study your word. And we believe that you have been present with us night after night, and we believe that you're going to be present with us today. I pray that you will be with Pastor Finley as he shares the message that you have for him to share with us today. May you fill him with your Holy Spirit and may you give him strength that he needs to share your word this morning. Thank you for the goodness and grace that you have shown us and thank you for the wonderful hope that we have because of our faith in you and that you're coming back again soon. We pray all of this in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Charles Hagerbrooks has blessed us with his music. And there's a special song that Charles has sung for us over the last few years. The song is called I Have Returned. Some of you may have heard it. It is a song by Mary Jane Wilkin. 
she wrote the song and came to one of our meetings. She is a great songwriter, wrote for many of the country music stars in Nashville, Tennessee. She, in fact, if you knew the, know the name Chris Christopherson, uh, Mary Jane Wilkin made him, actually built his career for him. Just an amazing songwriter. But when she went to the top of her profession, she became very discouraged, disillusioned with what she was doing, discouraged with her work, and she looked back and said, my life is not worth very much at all. And she went, she took a gun one day, and very wealthy woman went to kill herself, and she stopped. The gun didn't go off. And she knelt down and began to pray that God would bring her back to her senses. As she did, words came to her mind, I've returned to the God of my fathers. And she wrote the song, I have returned, based on her own experience of drifting from God and coming back to God. When she heard Charles sing that, she could have had any singer in America sing it. She came to Charles and she said, Charles, I want you to record, I have returned. The words of the song penetrate our hearts. The words of the song lead us to a deep conviction to stay faithful to God. Charles, I've returned. I have returned to the God of my childhood, to the same simple thing as a child I once knew. Like the prodigal son, He's amazing. I long for my loved ones, for the comfort of home, and the God I outgrew. But I have returned to the God of my childhood. He is Bethlehem's baby. He's a prophet's Messiah. But he's Jesus to me. Eternal deity. Praise his name. I have returned. I have returned to the God of my father with unfailing faith. I'm the child of his heart. Now I just heard a shout from the angels in glory. Singing praises to his name. That child has come home. I have returned to the God of my mother. I learned at her knee that he is a lily of the valley. But he's Jesus to me, he eternal deity, praise his name, I have returned, I have returned to the Yahweh of Judah, on my knees I did fall. Where walls once stood, now the lesson I've learned as I work my way homeward, the Creator of all. He is a comfort to men. 
I have returned to the father of Abraham. He is the shepherd of Moses, who call him the great I am. But he's Jesus to me. Eternal deity, I'll praise his name. I have returned, I have returned to the God of my fathers with unfailing faith. He is a God of my heart, he's the shepherd of Moses, he is a great I am, I have returned. And thank you for being so flexible to honor the Lord. You know, one time, Charles and I were in Jamaica, in a great city square where there was a meeting. People gathered together. It was kind of a celebration of God's work there. And um, at the last minute, the host of the meeting said, Pastor Mark, come and speak. And I said to Charles, after I speak, and we're outdoors, there's a lot of chaos, you know, and a lot of activity going on. And, after I, sp I, I was walking on the platform, I said, Charles, after I speak, seeing I've returned. So there outdoors in the uh, square, the city square, with all that commotion around, I spoke, and Charles got up and sang, I've returned. I made a simple appeal, and people began to come to Jesus. It's amazing to see how God uses music to touch hearts, to change lives. One time, Charles and I were in South Africa, I was speaking at Vich University, one of the top 50 universities in the world. And then we pitched a tent out in Soweto. And uh, I had said to Charles, have you ever been to Africa before? He said, no, Mark, I've never been to Africa. I said, all right, I'm going to be out in Soweto preaching in his tent. It was, a, it was a tough time. And Charles came. He walked into the tent, and the choir walked off the stage, and they began to sing, Welcome Home, Brother, and watched him around the tent. It just, he and I have had so many amazing experiences together. We've seen the Spirit of God come down. We've seen the Lord touch hearts through the preached Word of God and through Charles' his music. Would you bow your heads with me again as we just ask God to be with us especially? Father, we're talking about the second coming of Christ. And there's nothing as important as the second coming as far as a historical event that soon will come. You created the world once. You entered into human life and died once. And you are coming again. And I pray, Lord, that this meeting would clearly reveal just how you are going to return, but most of all, move our hearts and prepare us for that day. In Christ's name, amen. Some of you may remember that the book of Revelation can be summarized in four words. Pastor Wilson talked about that last night. Jesus wins and Satan loses. Revelation's final events need not frighten us. They need not scare us. They can encourage us with the sense that we're living on the knife edge of eternity. As you think back, you may remember the flight of the Columbia Space Shuttle. There's something about space that fascinates us, something about space that intrigues us, something about space that ministers or speaks to our curiosity. The, on January 16, 2003, the Columbia blasted off. It had seven astronauts aboard. There were five men, two women, and for the first time an Israeli astronaut was going to be going into space. At that blast off, at the lift off, the propulsion was so great that it ripped a piece of foam off the Challenger. That piece of foam hit some tiles but unbeknownst to mission control, those, one of the tiles, or two or three, were broken, and the wires began to heat. 
they heated up above normal. Nothing happened initially until on February 1, 2003, the Columbia was going to enter our atmosphere again. And as it did, that spaceship exploded. All seven were killed. All of us one day are going to go on a space journey. But here's the incredible good news. This journey will not only begin well, but it's going to end well. When Jesus comes in ret to return, the journey that we are going to go on, this journey through space, we have a commander that is committed to take us home. Our commander is not going to abort the mission. The final mission is not going to explode some way so that uh, men and women on that mission experience fatalities. We are going to travel beyond the moon 240,000 miles away, travel beyond the planets, travel beyond the sun 93 million miles away. Think of what it's going to be like traveling through space, speeding through the air, traveling up through Orion, that great chasm in space that even scientists now wonder about what's at the end of that. Traveling to the throne of God, seeing the golden gleaming gates of the city of God open and hearing the angels sing, welcome home, earth beings. We've ascended from earth. We've traveled through space. We have the warm welcome of the angels and the warm embrace of heavenly beings. The entire theme of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the central theme of the book of Revelation. Now when you look at Revelation, there are two aspects of it, two what I would call foci of Revelation. We have Jesus the Lamb of God and we have Jesus the coming King. 28 times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is mentioned at the, as the Lamb of God. That's four times seven. Seven in the book of Revelation is a symbol of perfection. You've got seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven branch candlestick. That's a symbol of perfection. Four in the book of Revelation is a symbol of universality. So when you have four times seven, 28 times the Lamb of God is mentioned. Christ, the perfect universal Savior for all mankind. So Jesus is mentioned as the Lamb in the book of Revelation, but he's also mentioned in the book of Revelation as the coming King. And the theme of the book of Revelation is the Christ that came once to provide our salvation is coming again to take us home. When Jesus came the first time, he was born as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. And very, very few people recognized his first coming. In a sense, we might say it was a silent coming. There were a few shepherds there. Later, the wise men came. But most people had no idea about the coming of Christ the first time. They didn't sense that he was the Messiah. When he comes the second time, that's going to be dramatically different. Nobody is going to miss it. God's end time plan of just how Jesus is going to come is revealed throughout the book of Revelation and in his word. Let's look at some of the passages in Revelation that talk about the return of Jesus and this coming king. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, we read, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Throughout scripture, kingdoms rise and fall. Babylon rises and falls. Medo-Persia rises and falls. Greece rises and falls. Rome rises and falls. Throughout history, nations rise and nations fall. But the kingdom of Christ will last forever and ever and ever and ever. Revelation 11, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Here's another prophecy in Revelation, Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man. And the scripture says that um, this Christ that came, that sat like the Son of Man on his head, was a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, now in the Bible, for example, a, a sharp sickle in Scripture represents reaping. A trumpet represents victory. So when you think of Christ coming with this sharp sickle, 
that represents judgment. It represents harvest. When you, he comes with the trumpet, that represents the glory of victory. So when Jesus comes again, it's judgment for all humanity, that final judgment when the righteous are caught up to meet him in the sky, the wicked living are destroyed with the brightness of his coming, and the trumpet blast of victory. Jesus wins, Satan loses. We find that in Revelation 14, the harvest idea. We then go to Revelation chapter 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And upon that white horse, he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. The scripture goes on to put it this way. And the armies in heaven, clothed with white linen, fine linen, white and clean, followed him on their white horses. Now in scripture, a white horse is a symbol of purity, victory, and triumph. When the Roman, Romans attacked and overthrew a particular country, they would leave and return the general would on a white horse leading the captives. So look at the symbols we've studied so far in Revelation. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is the one that died for us, the perfect Savior. 28 times in the book of Revelation he's mentioned. Jesus is the coming King. Every prophecy in Revelation, every sequence in Revelation, ends with victory for Christ. Not one of those sequences ends with a defeat for Jesus. If you look at the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, every prophecy points to one place. Every prophecy comes to a glorious climax. Every prophecy finds its focal point in Jesus Christ, who comes as King of Kings, Jesus who comes as Lord of Lords, Jesus who comes to defeat wickedness, Jesus who comes to destroy evil, Jesus who comes to vanquish the powers of hell, the Christ who triumphed over the principalities and powers of hell, will indeed come again, streaming down the court of the sky. But the question says, there are so many different ideas about how Jesus will come back the second time. And how can I know that I'll be ready when he comes? In the scripture, the Bible leaves no question about the return of Christ. Now there will be a great deal of deception before Jesus comes. Jesus warns us of that. Luke the 17th chapter, the 23rd verse. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. The scripture continues, Matthew 24, 26. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. So there will be deceptions. There will be those that say, Christ has appeared. He's there in New York City, and he's healing the sick in the masses. He's there in Tokyo. He's there in Paris. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, the devil will come down upon you knowing he has a short time. Wouldn't it be just like the devil and his evil angels to masquerade as a being of dazzling brightness to deceive the multitudes just before the true coming of Christ? Wouldn't it be just like the devil to try to pull off a counterfeit second coming to deceive thousands of people? What if there were stadiums that were packed what if the devil put his spell upon people and made them sick and then took that off and they were apparently healed? But the Bible tells us not to be deceived because we know that when Jesus comes, he's not going to come down walking upon this earth. He's not going to come down and appear in this place or in that place. The Bible tells us just how Jesus is going to come. Luke 17, verse 24. Let's read it together from the screen. You ready to read? Luke 17, verse 24. Reading together. For as lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in this day. So when Jesus comes, it's like lightning flashes from one end of heaven to the other. It is not some secret event. It is not some silent event. Christ is coming down from above. He won't rise up from below. 
He's not coming to walk among human beings as a great healer or miracle worker. Christ's coming also is not some kind of spiritual, mystical event in which Jesus comes into the hearts of human beings and there is kind of an age of Aquarius or peace on earth. There are some who teach that Christ is going to come secretly in some kind of a rapture. We're going to talk about that a little later in the lecture and look at those passages. There's others who have the idea that when Christ comes, he's going to usher in a new millennium and that the second coming of Christ in the Bible is really the coming of Christ to the hearts of people and Jesus is going to bring peace on earth. Now, don't misunderstand me. Christ wants to come into our hearts, change our lives from within. But the only time there'll be permanent peace on earth is when the Prince of Peace descends from the sky. The only time there'll be peace on earth permanently is when Jesus comes down from the sky and we're caught up to meet him in the air and ultimately his holy city descends. The coming of Christ is not some nirvana event, but the coming of Christ is a very real, a very literal event. Let's look at it in scripture. You remember Jesus stood on the mountain there, about ready to ascend to heaven. Man steps off a mountain and goes down. God steps off a mountain and goes up. Because the laws of gravity cannot keep the creator of gravity down. And the Bible says, the angels there are, are there beside the disciples. Now, I can just imagine that scene in my mind. Christ is about ready to come to heaven. And the angels look at the Father, and they say, Father, the disciples are going to go through some very traumatic times. Father, the disciples, or many of them will be persecuted. All of them except one may suffer, will suffer a martyr's death. They say to God, God, can we go and encourage their hearts? So angels descend from the realms of glory, and they come down. And the disciples are standing there, gazing up into heaven. They're straining their necks to see the last lingering vision of the Christ that's walked with them and talked with them and been with them for these last three and a half years. And the angel says, this same Jesus, the same Jesus that walked the dusty streets of Galilee, the same Jesus that walked the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem, the same Jesus that touched the eyes of the blind, they were open, the same Jesus that touched the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped, the same Jesus that touched the withered man's legs and it was healed, this same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, so shall come again as in like manner as you've seen him go up into heaven. When the angels say Jesus is coming again, I believe it. What about you, friends? The Bible says that Christ is going to come in like manner. He ascended in the clouds, and he will descend in the clouds. A very real Christ ascended, and a very real Christ will descend. So Christ's coming is literal. Christ's coming is also a visible event. It's not simply an event that takes place that we perceive in our hearts. It's a very real, literal event, and it's a visible event. The Bible says, Revelation 1-7, Behold, let's read it. Behold, he's coming with cloud. He, he, he might come, right? Maybe he'll come, right? It's likely he'll come, right? What, what's what scripture say? He is coming with what? clouds and a few people are going to see him. Every eye is going to see him. The eyes of the young and the eyes of the old. The eyes of the rich and the eyes of the poor. African eyes will see him come. Asian eyes will see him come. South American eyes will see him come. And we will see him come. Every eye will see him come. Now somebody said, Pastor Mark, we live in a round world. How can every eye see him come? The Bible says he's going to come as lightning, right? What is the speed of light? The speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. That means in far less than a second, Jesus could circle the earth. And your eyes cannot discern a fraction of a second. So if Jesus is coming with the speed of light, and the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second, he can circle the earth so quickly that every eye could see him 
and discernibly it would be at the same time. So the Bible says he's coming and every eye is going to see him. It doesn't say he's coming some kind of secretly, does it? Christ's coming also, the Bible says, is going to be an audible event. So it's a, it's a literal event, it's a visible event, and it's also an audible event. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. With a what? Boy, that was a great shout. With a what? Shout. With a shout, yeah. Why do you shout a shout? Why do you shout a shout? You shout a shout because you want to get attention, right? So this doesn't seem very silent, does it? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. That's a trumpet of glory, the trumpet of victory. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Incidentally, it's a little strange to think, if the dead already went to heaven, well, why are they going to rise? You see, that's what the Bible teaches 53 times. It teaches death is but a sleep. So when you die, you rest. There's no consciousness. Christ comes and he raises the dead. And then the Bible says that as the dead in Christ rise, it tells us that we together with them are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I remember one night I was speaking about the second coming of Christ and the glorious day that when Jesus Christ would come again and uh, when the graves would open and Jesus would return. And as I was speaking, I said, how can I ever make this real to an audience? And I thought, what if, what if I just describe an imaginary scene? And I said, let's suppose you had a little baby, six months old, and the baby had a terrible crib death. It pulled the blanket over its head and the baby died. And you would go to that grave and you would just weep over that grave. But one day, lightning shines from the east to the west. One day, the earth trembles. One day, Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and that baby is resurrected and put in your arms. And I kept thinking, how can I ever make this real to my audience? And I said, what if that little baby's name was Amanda? I had never used that name in a lecture before. And what if little Amanda was raised from the dead, mama? And what if she was put in your arms and together you felt those little hands on your cheeks again? You, you looked into that little baby's eyes again and you saw her smile again. And together with the angels, you ascend to heaven where there's no sickness, suffering, and death. At the end of the meeting, a lady came up to me and said, Pastor, we've got to talk. I said, what do you mean? She said, how, do you know? how did you know? I said, how did I know what? How did you know that I had a little baby by the name of Amanda? And the baby died at six months. And I came to your meeting tonight so depressed. I had gone to the psychologist, and the psychologist said, the only way you can be free from this terrible memory is to buy a doll, name it Amanda, and then go have another burial for that doll and, and say goodbye to the doll. She said, Pastor, I didn't know what to do. I was so discouraged because of the death of my baby, but I came to your meeting tonight not the end. I saw there was going to be a glorious resurrection. And when you read that passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. What are the next two words, everybody? Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, Lord in the air. Someday you can see that father that died. Someday you can see that mother that died. Someday that child that is so sick that you put in that grave is going to rise up again and we're going to travel through the clouds together. No more separation, no more heartache, no more sorrow, no more death, no more longing for that warm embrace that you cannot feel any longer. Jesus is coming. Every eye will see him. Every ear will hear him. And the Bible says, so we shall ever be with the Lord. Christ's coming. There's also a glorious event. We read about it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. A real Christ is coming in the sky. A real Christ is coming to resurrect the dead. A real Christ is coming to take us home. The journey on earth may be long. The road on earth may be rough. Sickness, suffering, death, accidents. But yet, the Son of Man is going to appear in the heavens. Now, Jesus' coming is not going to be a, is not going to be a joyous event for everybody. Because the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 30, the Son of Man will appear in heaven 
and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now notice when Jesus comes, it's not that he comes to rapture the righteous and the uh, living wicked, the living unsaved, don't know what happened. It's not that at all. The Son of Man is going to appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn. Who are the tribes of the earth? The unsaved. And then the Bible says, every eye is going to see him. That's the eyes of the wicked and the eyes of the righteous. That's the eyes of the saved and that's the eyes of the unsaved. And it says, they will see. That's the unrighteous. That's the wicked. So it's not just that the righteous see him coming and they're raptured off. Not at all. It says they'll see the Son of Man coming with clouds, with power and great glory. Jesus came as a babe in Bethlehem's manger once. He came and very few people knew he had come. But the second time, when this whole controversy between good and evil ends, when this whole crisis between good and evil ends, Christ is not going to come secretly. The whole universe is going to know it. It's glorious. Every eye sees it. Every ear hears it. It is a climactic event as well. This event settles the human destiny of all humanity. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 15, verse 51 to 53, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all, what everybody? Sleep. So death is like a sleep until the coming of Jesus. We shall not all sleep. But what does it say? We shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So when we go to sleep in death, it's like the next thing we know, we wake up. Like, you know, when our children were young, we used to bring them to meetings. And so sometimes when my little boy, Mark Jr., was young, he is in dermatology now and sees about 40, 50 patients a day at times. But when he was a little boy, I'd be preaching in these stadiums and auditoriums like this. My wife would bring him and we'd have a little, little uh, blanket and we'd put him over here in the little blanket. He'd sleep. Now, he would go to sleep during my preaching. It's all right if he goes to sleep, but you better not. Uh, but so he'd sleep. And at the end of the meeting, I'd carry him. You know, we were in New England at the time and up in Connecticut, you know, it's snow. And uh, we'd be taking him home. And sometimes the roads would be icy and I'd kind of drive and skid, go past a truck, you know, and so forth and so on. You, you, you'd almost go in a ditch and I'd get him home. He'd still be sleeping, put him in the little crib. And uh, next morning, this little boy would wake up. He'd say, Daddy, are we still at the meeting? You still preaching? I said, son, I preach long, but I don't preach that long, you know. And so, you see, he had no consciousness of time, did he? He fell asleep. And so the next thing we know, that father that mother, that sister, that brother that is resting in, in Jesus right now in that grave, the next thing they know is Jesus calling their name, John come forth, Mary come forth, Alice come forth, Joseph come forth, and those graves open, and their bodies are changed immediately, as the Bible says, and they receive glorious immortal bodies, and as they do that, we too who are living receive those glorious immortal bodies. The Bible says, the trumpet shall sound a victory. The dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. Traveling through the illimitable realms of space, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal, what does mortal mean? Subject to death. What does mortal mean? It means subject to disease, and heartache, sorrow. We must put on immortality, no sickness, no suffering, no death, no heartache. Christ comes, the graves are open, the living righteous and the righteous dead are caught up to meet Christ in the sky. Can you imagine what that's going to be? The most spectacular event in the history of the universe. You do not want to miss it. Is anything worth clinging to to miss the event of the second coming of Christ? Are any of the trinkets and cheap pleasures of the world or the habits worth holding on to to miss that day when Jesus Christ returns again? Revelation 15.3 says that great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. Jesus wants to bring everybody to heaven. But if Jesus brought everybody to heaven, it wouldn't be heaven. It would be Indianapolis, right? What do you think, right? So Jesus wants to bring everybody to heaven, but he's, he can't do that because if he did, somebody would be robbing the streets of gold, somebody would be climbing over the walls and trying to rob something else. So, so 
Jesus wants now to come into your heart and mine, to so fundamentally change us from within that we experience the presence of God here and that we are so in tune with God and his presence so fills our lives that we no longer have a taste for earth in our mouth. We long for the streets of eternity. We long for fellowship with Christ. We have such fellowship with him here that we long for that permanent fellowship in heaven. And we long for that day when the sad saga of death will be over. And we long for that day when he will come. We long for that day, as it says in Isaiah 25, verse 9, Behold, this is our God. We have done what? What have we done? We've waited for it. We haven't given up in trial. We haven't given up in difficulty. We haven't given up in sorrow. We haven't given up in disease. We haven't even accepted the false Christ who's come. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. It will be worth waiting. Whatever trial you go through. Whatever difficulty you go through. It's going to be worth it when Jesus Christ comes again. That's why the Bible says to us, Behold, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. People come to meetings like this all the time. And they say to me, Pastor Mark, um, I know I should make a decision for Christ, but, but, but. Don't worry about your buts, just make the decision. See, somebody says, but, 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 but don't, I told you, don't worry about those buts, just make your decision for Christ. Here's the point. Did the Red Sea open before Moses stepped in or after Moses stepped in? He had to put his feet in the water, right? So the problems that you are facing that hold you back from walking through this baptismal pool and totally giving your life to Christ, those problems are not going to be solved unless you step out. Unless you say, Lord, I am trusting you. Lord, I'm making a decision for you. Lord, I'm committing my life to you. Our eternal destiny is being settled by the choices we make every single day. Now, let's summarize what happens when Jesus comes. First, the Bible says there'll be a great earthquake, so there'll be seismic upheavals, lightning flashes from the east to the west, the righteous dead will be resurrected, the righteous living will be changed, immortality will be bestowed on both the dead and the living, the wicked living will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming, the righteous will welcome Christ, uh, and the righteous together will ascend to heaven. Now, somebody says, but Mark, there's a text in the Bible that says that uh, Jesus is going to come as a thief. There's a text in the Bible like that. I, I, and, I, and isn't there a text in the Bible that says something about two in the field, one taken, one left? 1,500 times in the Bible. The Bible mentions the second coming of Christ. Once in every eight verses in the, for every eight verses in the Old Testament, that for every one verse in the Old Testament that speaks about the first coming of Christ, there are eight verses that speak about the second coming of Christ. Once in every 25 verses in the New Testament it speaks about the coming of Christ. Those verses all speak about Jesus coming. Every eye is going to see him. Every ear is going to hear him. It's like lightning flashes from the east unto the west. So if you have a few texts, you don't throw out 1,500 texts to try to harmonize them with a few. You look at the context of those few texts. So let's, let's just look at them. Does the Bible say Jesus is coming as a thief? It does. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that hour... Now notice the key word here is that day or hour. No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, the scripture says, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken up. Now notice what this text is emphasizing. It is not emphasizing how Christ comes, but the time is coming. It says, if we would have known the hour, the time of his coming, that he's coming as a thief. So in other words, when the Bible uses the term thief, it is indicating that Jesus would come at a time, at an hour, we don't expect it. So let me ask you about Indianapolis thieves. 
anybody here know anything about Indianapolis thieves? Do they come like this? Don't leave your house tonight because I'm going to crawl in your back window and rob you. Do Indianapolis thieves announce they're coming? Do they do that? You say, Pastor Mark, they certainly don't do that. So they come swiftly, quickly, unexpectedly, right? So when Jesus comes, it's a literal coming. Every eye sees it. Every ear hears it. He comes with lightning. He comes with 10,000 times 10,000 angels gloriously. But he comes quickly and unexpectedly as a thief. That's what the Bible says. Look, Matthew 24, 44. Therefore, you also be ready. Why we ought to be ready? For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect it. So the thief references have nothing to do with the manner of his coming, everything to do with his, the time of his coming. Now to show you that in another text, that this is not speaking about the manner of Christ's coming, look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. So this is not some rapture where Jesus sneaks back as a thief and raptures a few people. When he comes as a thief, he comes with what kind of noise, everybody? What kind of noise? Great noise. And then the Bible says, what else happens when he comes as a thief? The elements will melt with fervent heat. So when he comes as a thief, it's not that he raptures a few, but he comes with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are in it are going to be what? burned up. So when Jesus comes, there's no second chance. When Christ comes, men and women are, are, are saved or lost. The second coming of Christ is a surprise to the unprepared. But somebody says, but Pastor Mark, there's some passage in the Bible someplace about one taken and the other left. This is one of the most misunderstood, misinterpreted texts of all the Bible. Look what it says. Luke 17, verse 36. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Does it say that the person who's left is left alive? Is that what it says? No, it just says he's left. Okay. Then Jesus explains that passage. He says, as it was in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, how many classes were there? Two. One class went into the ark. One class did not go into the ark. So you only have two classes in the days of Noah. Was anybody left alive on earth in the days of Noah? No. So one taken, one left in the days of Noah. One saved, one lost. One alive, one dead. Then he goes on. Likewise, it'll be in the days of what? Lot. What was it like in the days of Lot? Did some come out of the city? Yes. Lot and his family. They were saved. Were some left in the city? Yes. Were they left alive? No. They were destroyed. So then Luke 17 says, it's like that when the Son of Man comes. And the question is asked, when the Son of Man comes, where, Lord? In other words, what happened to these people who were not saved? And the Bible says, where the body is gathered, they will be gathered. So they're destroyed with the brightness of Christ's coming. The point of this parable, one taken, one left, is that there only be two classes. In other words, our salvation is not something to trifle with. Our salvation is not something to play with. That God is speaking to our hearts. Revelation 6, verse 15 to 17. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man. The Bible says, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. When Jesus comes, he comes to save all humanity. But those that have rejected his love, those that have turned their backs on his claims, those who will not accept the gracious invitation that he gives them and who have idols in their heart and refuse to walk all the way in his truth, he couldn't possibly bring them into heaven because they're not safe to save. And they would start this rebellion all over again. And so the scripture says, the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? In other words, what scripture is saying is there's no second opportunity. There is the time to get serious about your salvation is now. And if you've been hesitating about any decision for Christ, this is the hour to make that decision. God did not bring you to these meetings simply to learn further information. You may be a church member, you may be a not a church member. Whoever you are today, God has brought you here for a purpose. 
in his divine drama of destiny, in the interweaving of the providences of God, God has brought you here for a purpose. He's brought you here to make eternal decisions, to take another step in your Christian life. Because when Christ comes again, it'll be a literal coming. It'll be a visible coming. It'll be an audible coming. It'll be a glorious coming. It'll be a climactic coming. And it will be an incredible, joyous event. Jesus said, read it with me please from the screen, John 14, verse 2 and 3. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus says, good news. Jesus says, let your hearts be filled with joy. Jesus says, when tears flow from your eyes and you have lost a loved one, Jesus says, have that assurance, I will come again. Some time ago, my mother developed cancer. Her mother had been a two-pack-a-day smoker, and mom took up the problem of smoking and smoked a pack and a half and then finally quit, committed her life fully to Christ, but the damage done from smoking was there. Mom developed lung cancer. And we shared with her, kept sharing with her the promises of Christ's coming, that Jesus would come and his lightning shines from the east even unto the west. We knew she didn't have much time left. And I kept asking my sisters, because I was traveling and preaching tours and had seen my mother before I went on the tours. And I said to my sisters, now look, I've got to go preaching again. She may survive another month. It may be three months. It may be six months. We just don't know. So I'll call in every day, and um, you let me know how she's doing. So we were traveling in the Caribbean, and I called my sisters, and they said, Mark, she took a turn for the worst. It looks like within a few days she's going to die. You need to come home. So we left our preaching tour, and I got a ticket, Tini and I, my wife and I, and we, we flew home. My mother was living in Deltona, Florida at that time, and uh, I flew into Orlando. Didn't get there till about 12, 12.30 at night, and we didn't want my mother to die in the hospital. So we, brought her, we had brought her home before that, and we put her in a hospital bed in the living room. I tried to be quiet. Tini and I opened the door, coming into the house. And she's lying on this bed in the living room. And you know, there are some experiences you have in life that they're deeply etched in your brain. You never forget them. And I walked into that room that night, and I was just coming through the door, and I heard my mother's voice, and this is what she said. Son, I knew you would come. Son, I knew you would come. She knew that I would not let her die alone. She knew that I would be there holding her hand and rubbing our fingers through her hair. Son, I knew you would come. And Jesus says to you and to me today, my child, Whatever tears flow from your eyes, whatever heartache breaks your heart, whatever loved ones you have lost, I'm going to come. I am going to come. And I want you to be ready for my coming. I want you to put priorities on the thing that really counts. And there's only one thing that can satisfy us today and forever, and that's an eternal decision for Christ. That's an eternal decision for the King of kings and Lord of lords. My dear friend, Pastor Kevin, is going to enter the baptismal pool just now. Here are two that have made that eternal decision for Christ. Praise God, Pastor Kevin. Pastor of the Capitol Memorial Church. And he has two that are walking in the water. They want to be ready for the coming of our Lord. Jesus Christ. They want to be ready when Jesus descends down the corridors of the sky. Walking in the water. Raise your hand, Emily, so I can see you, okay? There she is. Can you greet her? Raise your hand. Say, praise God for Emily. And Sandra is walking in the water as well. 
praise God for these two ladies who've made their decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We raise our hand now, Miss Emily. We thank God for your decision to follow Jesus. We thank God that he's touched your life and that you want to follow him now and forever. So we lift our hands to heaven and we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 My dear sister, you are clean. Pastor will pray for you. And Sandra, Emily's granddaughter has come. And she has come to commit her life anew to Christ. She has come to be cleansed by the grace of Christ. She has come to follow Jesus and keep his commandments and walk in the way of Christ. So my dear sister, because you want to follow Jesus, you want nothing between your soul and Jesus. You want to walk in his way, be part of his last day people that around the world today, over 3,000 will be baptized into the Adventist church and family. And so we lift our hands to heaven and baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Charles, sing I've Decided. One verse. Let's get him singing it together. I, I have decided sing together. to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the world behind me, the cross, the cross before me. The world, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, praise God, no, no turning back. Many of you last evening filled out a response card that you want to look forward to baptism. We have another response card today. Ushers, can you pass that out just now, please? I want to be sure that our message was clear to you today by filling out the response card, and I hope every single one of you will fill this out because it really, it does two things. One, it helps us to understand that the messages we have are clear. But second, the response card helps you in your walk with Christ. The first line on this card says, I believe Jesus will come literally, personally, visibly, and audibly. How many of you, that's clear to you today that when Christ comes, just say amen, he's gonna come literally, personally, visibly, and audibly. Is that clear to you today? Was it clear from the lecture? Okay, check that box. Just put a box there. If you need a pen or a pencil, just raise your hand, please, okay? Because I want to be sure that every person fills out this card. You may be a church member, you may not be, but that's okay. Just fill out the card. Secondly, it says, I desire to be ready for Jesus' return. If that is your commitment today, that you say, look, there may be some things in my life that are not in harmony with God's will, but I want to be ready for the return of Christ. You can check that second box, okay? Third box, I'd like to be baptized soon. If you have not yet walked through the water of baptism, when you walk through that water, it's a symbol that your sins are cleansed, you have new life in Christ. The peace of God will flow into your life 
and Jesus promises the Holy Spirit at baptism, and as we open our hearts, he grants us the power, he grants us the strength of his Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. One of the reasons many people keep stumbling and falling is they've never made that commitment to Christ. And as the result of that, they stumble, they fall all the time. But if we make that commitment, we make the commitment, Christ supplies the power. So check that box, I'd like to be baptized soon. Now let me talk to you, to you about some people who have already been baptized. There may be people, there are two reasons for rebaptism. Number one, you may have been baptized and you drifted away. You've, you, you broke the commandments of God and you, you, you lived a life that was not in harmony with God's will and you still feel uncomfortable about that. When you go into the water to be rebaptized, you are recommitting. We don't get rebaptized every time we sin. But if you have been separated from Christ, he is appealing to you today to make that decision for rebaptism. The second reason we're rebaptized is this. There are many Baptist Christians, many Pentecostal Christians. They've been baptized by immersion. But they come to meetings like this and they hear Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, where Jesus says, go therefore uh, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them whatever I've commanded you. They never learned what Christ commanded, knew very little about the Bible's Sabbath. And they desire to walk into the water again, to cleanse from the errors of the past. That may be your choice. If you choose, you can be part of the family of God by profession of your faith if you've already been baptized. But check that third box and we'll counsel you. If you need more reading material on Jesus coming, simply fill out that box. Take time to meditate upon your decision right now. If you need a prayer request, write it on the back. Our prayer team will fill that out. And Charles, Lord, I'm coming home. Lord, I'm coming home. Just take a moment to hold your card in your hand. Pray over your card. Make this a very sacred moment of trust for you. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm a coming home. The path of sin too long I have trod, but now I'm coming home. If you know it, sing the chorus with Charles. Coming home. Coming home, coming home, nevermore to roam. Open wide, open wide your arms of love. Ushers, once you've collected the cards, you can bring them down. So you can collect your cards now. Pass your buckets across if you haven't collected them yet. Eternal decisions are made on these cards. One night I was preaching in Brazil. A young man filled out his card for baptism. He had been a drug dealer. He didn't turn it in. He filled out his card for baptism. He hadn't paid some drug money that he should have paid. That night he went home and um, the drug lords came to his house as he was just going to go in the door and he was shot to death on the doorstep. At the funeral his mother took out the card. There were scores of young people at that funeral. She began to wave the card and she said my precious son made his eternal decision that night and she appealed to those at that funeral as she read his card to them to make their decision too. That's why God is appealing to you today to make an eternal decision for Christ. Ushers, once you have the cards, all of you come down here and just stand and I'm going to pray over those cards. I want to be sure that we have everybody's card. Are we missing any cards on this side? 
Missing any ones on this side, okay? I want to be sure they're passed across. What about in the center? Anybody have a card in the center? You can wave it if you do. Ushers, be sure to pick them up. What about on this side? Any, we missing any cards? Okay, just wave your card. The ushers are all going to come. Ushers, just stand with your buckets here. I'm going to pray over them. Just gather here at the altar once you get all the cards. God knows every card. He knows every heart. He knows every single name. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. Stand with me, congregation. We're going to pray together. Oh, my Father, our hearts are full. We think of the second coming of Christ. And it's the most glorious event in history. And Lord, we don't want one person to miss that. So my dear Father, move among us. Thank you for these eternal decisions made on these cards. And we look forward to that day when Jesus will return. And every one of us, not missing one, will be in heaven with you together. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. We are going to take a five-minute break between now and the next program. If you need to get up, you need to stretch, you need to go to the bathroom. But I would encourage you, there's many more going to come in for the 11 o'clock meeting. I'd encourage you to kind of don't wander too far from your seat, or you might find somebody else sitting in it. And sitting on laps is not real comfortable, okay? So just take a break, stretch a little bit, and we'll see you soon. Kilanindavonivinatalivanaklu, Rawa in the relative of Kinabunwa Salevo Rotaka. Do Mandan on the Masu, to Ranga, Kimami Bogami Naka Vikimuni, me Rani Kunivotara, make Mami Vital and Notale, member Lady Kimuni, Kimami Suretakin and Nomini Coco, Tambun and Dalvi with the Mui, Quana Rau to Ranga and Ivari Taka Vikimami and Dina and Avuni Candina, make him in a clay Kimuni Vogoti, for Kiana Nominita Mati Valvaladan, you know, Sumuni Tico, Chisu, Nevombola. Amen. Na kaukua dhawa o vaka sangaratiko. Na kaukua dhawa o sanana magiti okina. Muna rao ni tokena, mera ni vaka ukua tekiko na ngaona nrenre vile dheki na sandoro makatungo. Una vina kata, muna vana numikenda tali. Ena itukutuku awa sadhao raka sa, ena ngaona saoti, ena singa saoti. Na nona vina kata, o paula metukuna na nduindu ini loloma. Ena nanda bola. Eti ko na loma baklo, kati ko talaga na loma bagata mata. O koya, e loma nona na tevoro. Senga talin nanda gay kaila loma bagata mata. Ni sa iba lo balada ko ira kaya nga nata mata. Karsa senga niya do ba na kaya baro rota kina na klo. Kano ba ni mali? Ngo na nona ilo loma nga na tevoro. Balita ni wakayal e ala e senga ni tao mundo. Yang nono nono lama nak keluar, esenga ni pakai yang lain. Entah sah rumah tu macam mana. Okey lah, yang kau nono lama ngoh, ada vina kata, minta tahu kena, vina kata, minta bagi tahu apa yang kena kena, ena visinga kira sana. Orang vina kata, mana kau tiki kena, ena nono bos tu tiko pola, nono bagan nuni kena tu tiko pola, ena dua nanti kena, ena nono roma, ena wasi walu nanti kena vitu, rumah tu mana nanti kena, ekai naga cungko pola, roma nana wasi walu, ena nanti kena vitu. Ni sabi mi zaki nai topo bagi ang oki na kelu, ia sa seng ni bor ngoda nai bunau ni kelu, ia sa nren resara ni bakakin. Tikine walu, ngai kau kau nai tikine walu. Ni kuira sa i topo bagi ang o, 
erasa seng ni the cover raw na ka even naka wana kalu wala wala danga era kita ketiko wala wala danga era da kaba tiko seng ni ngalala kino paula ngo na vuna ele tuku ne kino paula na no ni tuku tuku me tuku no koya ata mata wala loma ku yao ko ze me sereki yao mane yao ni mate ngo yao ni wala wala danga Entah yang way bola bola dah. Esok ni dua orang rawan ni serik kian dah mana bola bola dah. Anu bina kata mana kau temui dua orang tikin. Merah ni bawa nanu mi, kau bawa nanu mi aw. Ni seng ni daru ni rawata. Nanu daru bola bola temata. Seng bola bola yang aw. Mena daru serik kian daru mana bola bola dah. Entah daru nak bagai yang aw tunga, bagai yang aw tunga. Entah daru nanu mana daru sapi naka. Ia nak kelu mai lama lagi. Esenga. Ni kila dua orang kaya. Bina kau daru tak kawa. Balik ni aku kaya. E bagai rabi tunga aku kaya. Eno nona kau kua, seng ni kau kua, bawa temata. Eno ceramaya, ono kau temen tikin angguan. Ceramaya nawa sitin katul, nene tikin rosam bul katul. E bawa mata tata kau bikin dana tikin anggo. Ceramaya, e kai naka kina ceramaya, nana ceramaya, nawa sitin rosam bul katul, nana tikin a, e tikin katul, nawa sitin katul, nene tikin rosam bul katul. Kai naka bangguo, sabwa kata ni tak rawa lina kai diope na kulina, senale pati nana kena tabi tono tono. Keva kasa wakake keva kakina ndo na ngai rawata mundo zaka vinaka oike mundo kanda uzaka za. Sika ni rawa ena nanda kuko wata mata. Keva kaya visa utaka na lepate ena na kulina se ena manu manu ngwa na tabu tono tono. Nia ngona ena ngai rawa viko batiki yao mendaru na visa utaka na nanda mbula maina nduwa na mbula yi wala wala la kine mbula enga rabi koya waka wati na kalu. Sika ni rawa ena na rawata. Ngwa eka ina kachikino poula. Nyo kwa nata mata wala loma. E senga ni ngalala tala nga kino pula. Ia zawa minda na zakawa. A zawa minda na ngay. Nanungo minda na zakawa. Ine visi nga nindua. Kiso kwa tu ngon. Anona vosa pula. Ndua nata mata. E kilava kwa ti ni volo tambu. E kilava kwa ti na kalou. Kila zake wa kwa ti wa kwa ti. Naka mai viko na kalou. Yo yiko wata ki yao. Ndaru sa ngay wala loma zake sara. Wala loma zake sara. Ina kalau istilah ini beauty kita tu menda lebih niyali, kemu ni review kani lomani. Nak kalau lebih go, aku itu kuno koya, dia koya nak tuena sanda tu review kita ni lebih ngau nak kerisar. Semua ni fakta. Kiko fakta ke kemu do, ni fakta. Ni fakta waktu itu kiko rumora. Semua ni dua, nak kaya rendre wah nak kalau lebih go. Isa sulit tu koya nak nak aku kau, kiko fakta kiau, merawa, ni dah rawa kau kau taki. Merawa, entah rupu keiti kau nak, orang rendre, entah rupu dono maka, tuangko. Orang benda kata mana kau tak lemah dono tikina, entah mata ni kuat, entah sini kuat, entah Roman wasi vitu, entah tikina itu ni kawan. Nalai tu mana nanti kena orangko, entah Roman wasi vitu, entah tikina itu ni kawan. Kata kina, entah tikina orangko, Roman wasi vitu, entah tikina, itu ni kawan. Orang wilika, ni dah sakila. Saka waka yangu na ibunau, ya kwe yao, au sa waka yangu wale nga, ka usa voli taki kina za. Sanke tomano kwa na tikina tini kelima, a ka ka usa kita ketiko, au sa senga ni vinakata. Ia na ka ka usa vinakata, au sa senga ni kitaka. Ia na ka ka usa lata, au sa kita ketiko. Enda vinakata minta zaka, enda vinakata tiko minta zaka vinakana, vii singa kesa, vii singa kesa, zaka kandun donu. Murie tiko, na vii kai vinakata na kalu. Indah biva kinta dalat aki, nai bola bola dah, baleta. Indah sudut tu kau nai bola bola dah, nai bola bola dah. Enak kambiti kinta tunga, enak bingau nak kesar. Gono nak tu kau nak kena pola, nak tu kena gono. Tiada tiada kena ono, sanggai tu nak pola. Ia kau kau sa kita kena kau kau sa sengani bina kata, au sa kaki na ni sa bina kah nai bunau. Sanggai kau temui indah ni tu tu gono pola, enak nai bina kata kau emas semai kenda, kena dua tali na vosong gono nai bunau. Enak nai bunau. Nak kelu, tiada tiada kawan orang 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 beli kata lain. Ia kerja kaka usah kita kerana kaka usah seng ni bina kata, usah kaki kita ni sah bina kah, naik bunau. Ia ni dah kabut itu ni bala bala dah, dah kabut itu ni bala bala dah. Go na buna, eh yang kaki na, na naik bunau nak kelu. Merawa, ni di sini makam ikan dah dah, ni dah sah rai dah dah, entah nak gay bina kata, men dua nak kau kau, men wak kau kau tiket dah, men dah kakuah, ni na zakar latiko, enak bina orang. Minta nak zakat bina kita ko, enak bina mana tau aku? Kono nona bina kena kelu, kono nona zakat zakat nak kelu. Esenya telinga nona zakat zakat nato mata. 
en ona zaga zaga tau ndo ngana klo me fe ba ka mina kataki fe ba ka mina kataki au ndo numa en ndo nesere ona numa sare ndo nesere nesere ngo ba tongo na kana langa whisper a prayer in the morning whisper a prayer red no whisper a prayer in the evening keep your heart in tune azabo que retico fuana calo azabo que retico fuana calo na cau cua daba o que retico fuana calo na calo limbo e wara que quenta tunga e no vicina que sa wara que quenta na daba e vina cata no wara que quenta tu quenta wa wa tu e no vicina que sa tu que tu que te quenta cata me no manda e no vicina que sa que va cai en duna cai da Wana tamata me baka bi nakataki er wata nga na kelo mai lo malai senga ni ro wata en dona tamata Wana dona taki ko chun taki ko ngonga ro wata na kelo bate ni okwenga a buliko en buliao er ro talanga ni baka bi nakataki ko Lebu na motoka er sa ratu Embaki dua embaki rua Embaki tolu, embaki wa, semani rusa ngamulu sarambiaka na embaki. Ini nda suli wa. Nanda uripeta ki motoka ase, kona mikeni ki mebaka vina kataka. Ena yaba bala, ena zaka zaka, mbala teni okoya ekila na kaya rakawa. Nda mbule wala wala dha, semani vada wana nda ndeni ngaone nda mbule wala wala dha tukina. Na noa, nikuwa, rusa ngamulu na embaki saoti, Tolu sanga bulu nembaki saoti, semani vada dana embaki osa, vala vala zati kunga mayo, seka nire in rota garawa. Sule wana kelo, okwa nara ni chun tekiko, bati ni okwa mbuliko, mbuliyao, ero wata na kato doko. Ero wata na kato doko. Nge kato sabu mokoya, na tikina, kata raba, sangi tukuna kwa na tikina, tini kavitu, sa seka niko ye undina, sa kitaka na zanga, sa tiko vya. Zanga i tiko vwa. Nisa kila sa senga sara ni tiku vya una nungu itopu mga yango. Ndua na kabinaka. Nisa tiku nga vya una vina kata. Vina kata na kabinaka. Ia na kau kau wa meu kita kakina. Kau sa senga ni kunea. Fua dhava. Kau kua dhava waka nga taka tiku na mataka ni kua. Rao ni waka sabasa bata kiku. E seni rao ni nda waka sabasa bata kianda na tamata. Usa uli kooti. E waka na lea pati. E waka na manu manu ya. Sini rao ni vese uta kikua ya. Ona senga talangani rani vese o tekiko, waka tekiko. Tomana sombo ena tikina. E tiri kadiwa. Ena kabinaka ka usa kitaka, a usa senga ni kitaka. Ena zanga ka usa senga ni vinakata, a usa kitaka tiko. Tikini uro sanga bulu. Ia ke waka ka usa kitaka na ka ka usa senga ni vinakata. Sanga i senga ni koye undina sa kitaka na zanga sa tiko viyao. Baleta, oko ena mbulo waka yango. Oko ena mbula, ywala wala zangori. Ena zaka zati kwa nga, zaka zati kwa nga, ya ngori sara nga na muna, embiu maikina na yalo tamwe, kaya la chisu karisto. Viratona non tise ipeli, e anga vei ke mundou, meu lako, ke waka ona senga ni lako, zake vita mangu, ena senga ni lako mai na yalo tamwe. Ya sara nga na non itabi na yalo tamwe, me rawa, ni mai waka vinaka takiko, waka vinaka takiau, ena nga una nrenre, enda sandonu maka tungo, baleta. Na ngau na ni nono zaka zaka chikona teboro, vito seki chikona teboro, me waka na liyo ni satani, waka sangariko, waka sangariyao, me tilomiko, waka mateiko. Uko nanda ulamba mani waka tiku. Azaba mo vangitori kwa iti okina. Azaba mo wele ti okina. Vyo kani? Sa seki ni nondono menda wele. Menda sa waka sangarana kauko tambungo. Merani wuki kenta, menda ngangatiko. Ena vii singa kia sara. Roma na wasi walu. Tomana sombo, waso tiyao, nimbera ni nda toki na tikinoa ya. Sangele, tukuna ikio pia. Opaula, eka usakunea kina enduwa na ivunao sa tiko kina via unadha. Ni usa vie kitaka na vinaka. Ni usa vinakata na ivunao ni kalou ena lomangundina. 
iya ka usa kune en do tani ne vu nau en vitikengu arau sa vi mala ke ne vu nau sa tu en alomangu asa boka bombulo tekiau ke ne vu nau za o ko sa tiko en vitikengu hanga tu kuno ko ya ata mata bololo mo ko yau ko de me serikiau mena yango ni mate ko ke sa seni rani seriki ko polo boka tekiau ko ya ko ya vole ka zaki vu na klo en visinger sara o ko volana no ne vosa na klo Ena nai vola tamu vaka utiko ena kalo me rau vua me vola na vei tuku tuku er tuongo nai vola tamu ngai rau vua dawa vei ko mo rau ni seriki ko ena vei sina ni nomo mbola kesara go na nonai tavi na kalo levo na yalo tamu ena maviu ena wasi tini ka rua na tiki ne rusa mbolo ko walu ke na tiki ne rusa mbolo ko ono ko tamu vei ke na dona tiki na ongo ena maviu ena wasi rusa ena wasi Etini karua, na tikini rusa wala kawalu, kina tikini tolusa wala karua, kato kina wala ongo, iya keba kaka usaba ka sebir na teboro, ena kaukua ni yalo ni kalou, sangka yadu njine biki mundou, na mata ni tu ni kalou. Ena tikini rusa wala kadiwa, se sarota baka ibi, endua me dhuruma na vali ni nganga, me kovea na nona yaya, keba kai sa aseng ni visuka manda na nganga, ena ngai kovea muri, na nona yahu. Na kalou livu ngoa, ibi na kato kwa ya, me mai visuka, Na tevoro, o koe vaka vuna tiko na lenga na zaa ena no mumbula. Eli sabi suka, sana ki yadu vua, me taura ni yau, o koe ni yau taleta undua vua, o koe ni yau wa mai vaka lu siki na nanona nra. O iko, wata ki yau, voli iko, yu rao ni nona, katao mutu. Ngona ka, vina kata tiko na kalu. Hana vuna, e tiko kini na yalo tambu, me vi suka, na tevoro, o koe sa seng ni ndua na nona kau kaua. O ko sa vina kato ko me vanga na numi kenda tiunga ni kau ko zakim ma na nona kau ko na kalo sao o ti na nona kau ko sa rawo i o ti na kau ko mai kalibari lorvo ngone lewa tata nana ke ke muni na boro rongo ti umai na kalo le muni alo tambo na vuke i ko mora ni nganga ti ko ena vei singer sa se ni dona ka ena ni vua ngai to mana sombo ko ya ena ti na kata raba ena ti ki na tolo sombo ndua o ko ya ngo ka usa kai ki na vei ki mundou sa rao me ka ko ni zun rumi na tamata ena vuku ni non rei vala vala da ki na non ravosa da ki denga i e sa se ni rao me ka ko ni zun rumi na tamata ena non ravosa vala da da ta ka ne alo tamu ni non ai tavi ne vuke i ko vaka vi naka ta ki ko o ngai se nga ni ndo laba ti ko na ka tumba ena non na tuki tuki ena vei se nga ka sa Apa tak? Oh, bagai nak takat itu nak kau kongo, nak kau kau apa? Oh, kau yang tiko mai lama lagi, oh kau yang zak zak yang nendela ni way. Ayah tu kena, mengapa buli kena na buru buru tau tu kongo? Oh, kau yang zak zak telinga, na zak zak tiko na lama manda na visi yang kesar lah, merawa, ini darah ni ada, kilo lama lagi. Kau nak nanti tawin, ni alat tamu. Esyang ini nanti tawin atau mat? Nanti nanti tawin ngoi ko. Suliana no mumbula, ki wana yalo tambu, me velo itaki, ena no mumbula. Sanke tomana sombo koe ena tikina, kataraba. Ia ko koe andua ena vosa vada da ataka na lumi ni tamata, ena rao me kako ni zunruvi, kina. Ia ko koe andua sa vosa vada da ataka na yalo tambu, ena senga sarni rao me kako ni zunruvi, ena ngaona ngo, sena ngaona, mai muli. Wow, sa andua, na kalivu. Vosa vada da ataka vada wana yalo tambu, tuki tuki tiko. Ena katu mani lo mamu, ena vei singa kere sarna, siang ni baka tari kwe, me duru, ena lo mamu. Tuki tuki tiko kwa, ena katu mani lo mamu, ena vei singa kere sarna. Tuki tuki tiko, tuki tuki tiko, tuki tuki tiko. Vina katu kwe me lakwe yani, yani sa lakwe yani lo ma, ena lo mamu, nga tuku no kwe ya, ono baka ya kaibu vate ke iko, ono tiku vate ke iko, me tau mundu. Vina katu kwe ya, me buke iko, ka tau mundu. Madiu, na wasi vitu, na tiki ne vitu kina tiki ne tiki na kando. Dorong ada na tiki na ongo, ono vina kana. Muvu na numi kena tiki na na tiki na ongo. Madiu, na wasi vitu, na tiki na, vitu kina tiki na, tiki kando. Katoki na ongo, iya keba kah? Poso tia, wana na tiki na tiki kando ya, na tiki tiki wu meyake, tiki ne vitu. Do kere kere, kana soli biki mendo, do vaka sangra, kando no kunea, do tuk tuki, kana dola biki mendo, ni sarawata ko kwe ya ndo sa kere kere. Kasa kunea ko koya sa waka sangra, kanan do labi vua sa tuki tuki. Se ko zei manda, vei ke mundou ke waka sa kere man rai na luvena, ena sule vua endona vatu. 
que sa kereika en su lewa en dona ngata ya que bacando sa kilaco y que mundo no tomata la mundo su liana cave na cave erna lu mundo sangai nguva ga lebu dake me su lia ve que ve cave na cana ta mundo va la malangi vira sa kere kerwa lo malangi en dola tu no na katumba en no na vine kata mo kerea me ya lo o que é essa plaita que está louco? É só ler todo louco, mas não vi que havia nada que havia. Ainda me era nem que era que era voar. Se a tua coisa, me era uma coisa que não era. A dama está ali, me era que era. Que é uma coisa que está todo louco, mas não havia que havia. Que era uma coisa que não havia. Mas eu tinha um gol. Na cá, eu vim aqui todo o mal lá. Me era tico que não havia que havia. Porque eu tenho um gol. E eu tenho que ver. E na emoção, e na nossa tolo, e na tiquina, e tolo, e caiu na bomba na emoção, e na nossa tolo, e na tiquina, e tolo. Me rolou lá com a bota ali, e ele rua, que vai cair, e usa a senha na alobata. Lá com a bota que quando a calou, que vai cair a senha na alotambo. Lá com a bota que quando a timo, que usa a senha na alotambo. Rou na zaga da bota, rou na dua bota, e usa a tico na alotambo. Velho tá aqui, tico, não me rompo, rou a alobata. Que essa roata na calou meu lomalã e merto lhe tolo, a tua alobata, duas na cara toda cava. E na roata te lhe ave, ico bate que iau. E na roata ve ico, não me quando eu timo bate que ico. E na roata não me mata o vale. E na roata na loma de songo soni no loto. E na roata ve quente e burro burro teu loco. Mas não quando eu calou lhe vungo. Essa roata. E na tolo, e na roata, e na dona um dolo, e na roata, e na runa um dolo, tinha um dolo e se milhoni. Boleta, e eu quando eu na cau caua, e vim na cate. Me vou que ico, vou que iau. E na vecina, que essa roata. A tu daqui tu, na dor do vongo. Para não me coitar ali. Sangue tu daqui o coia. Sangue vi tu segui tu coia, não bom nesse vongo. Berra, berra, tico mai na tchim. E não, 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 olha, tico mai. O coia, ainda o vina cati, me trai tico na zina, e não, não, lá com mai na tchim. Mas não existe mai na tchim, é que soba, é vida bata, não olha sala na tchim. Sana tori na zina, sana ngei reido kwa na chain na lago chiku maisho to, kwa na nrebe ni chain na ngoni sala mena ziziwa. Ie na mbongi ni singo ngo, ama ni adho kwa ya mea asenga ni anraba. Ngo na ngei anra maikino kwa ya sa rongo dho kwa ya na sithi ni chain ni sa tangi chiku mai. Angai zizi ni natura ngo. Sithi ni kwa natura ngo, tauro kwa ya na nona zina, ngai zizi ni wakando donu yani, ena ngoni sala ni tatakoso ni chain ngo. Nak orang salah kan ikut nak orang ni salah, gaya lebih better nak orang zina. Salah better pun pun orang zina, gaya kira dah lakukan ya. Di saat hari tak usah bicara ya. Na chain, enam dua enam bumble lewu, enam kilo. Alu tu kira na chain, era mati tau loko, na tiko na lama ni chain. Salah itu kau na mati bilawai, gaya tarung itu kau na mati bilawai. Tarung tu tu na loya, pilih bater na loya tu dah gaya tuar bukan tarung itu kau ya. Sangai kaya itu na loya. Anu bina kata mana semua bukan tu donu nunggu tarung. Semua tu bangun don via, orang nunggu taro. Sangai tu kena nada turang anggo, awak nasi semua bangun don, baru orang tu, oh kaya, nak turang ni lewa. Awak nasi semua bangun don, nak nombor ni taro. Angkai kaya nako, oh kaya nello anggo. Awal betan izina, iya, awal betan izina. Wajaba, ev, wangkat tu kena izina. E na ngono la beta kina, a du sombu na turra ngongo, gai kai naka, e a senga ni wanga, ti kona zina. Na vuni non ramate, na vondo ti kona loma ni tre ngongo, ni a senga ni wanga tona zina. E la beta na zina na turra ngongo, e na nana koko to loko, ni a senga ni wanga tona zina. E na maziu, e na mwasi rusa ngavul ka, rusa ngavul ka lima, E na tikina, e tolu, e kakina baka ungo, na tikina waya. O ira tou ni lilia, e rato sa kauta na nato vizina, a rato sa seng ni kauta vata, ke na wai wai. E na na baka tokai, me nda utuku tuku lilia, ke baka e seng na wai wai. Ke baka e seng, ni zau na tiko na zina, ka baka muna tiko, na nona yalo tambu na kalo, vili utaki tiko. Aí a do me atotou na tua rangão, e na vida cai da cava, beleza? Nia lá vendo tu coi andou na zina, a senha tu nisso onde? E na bongi, se moia. Quem nem viu que não mani, na gona nem muito muito, e na sandu no magatongo, sabe na cati, na zina, 
ethode. Sabina kati, nathina, ethode. Sasir ninga ifina kati, nathina, okwe la veti tiko, and the muraka tiko, and the sawada, and the sasakama tiko na zakazaka, and the numen in the zakama na zakazaka, yeni senga tiko na wai wai, se kwea na nona yalo tambuna kelo and vi singa, and on the zakazaka, and a toyanga, na nona zakazaka. Sangin dan zat zat itu warna kelu, dan sana warna zat zat itu berleta, dan sana warna tukai, menda lulu vena na tebor, okoya, sangin nona kau kau wa, dan warna ngatakat itu, dan warna ngatakat itu nona tebor na kelu, dan tebor nona nona kau kau na tebor, dan versi yang kesar, mina kau berlebu, dan sangin kuah, dan nona na tu menda nang warna rana kau kau tambongo. Na kau kau ay sa ala tagi tu, na kau kau na wukie ko, wukie kenda, kamo kau siwi, sulit juga wukie na nandu bata, halo bata, wala kau kau na turanga, bleta, na lona sa tiko wiko, tiko wira, tiko na lamari songson lutu, tiko talaga wana kelu mula malangi, enda sa halo bata, kaya nga, wala kelu ngate kenda na kelu, enda singa ni kuwa, dona nanda masu, turanga, na kau lewo na nomi wewo na nomi tiko. Wukie kimi mami, wukie kimi mami, sang rana kau kua tamu ngo turanga. Na nomu ni alo tamu, baleta. Wukie kimi mami na zonri tiko, kawarai tiki kemuni tiko ni ojo chini wano ngoo. Chisuni wangbolaka.